world champs. The Astros have waited 44 years, their entire franchise history, to get to the World Series. The AL champs, the White Sox, haven't been here in 46 and haven't won at all since 1917. The Astros were awful early this season, while the White Sox struggled late. But both did enough to make the playoffs, and both have played some of their best ball in the playoffs. Two resilient teams with superior pitching clash in game one tonight. It's the 2005 World Series on ESPN Radio. Baseball Tonight pregame show presented by Monroe Shocks and Struts. Get Monroe and ride safe. With Dave Campbell, here's Dan Schulman. And welcome to U.S. Cellular Field here in Chicago for tonight's game, one of the 2005 World Series between the Chicago White Sox and the Houston Astros. I'm Dan Schulman, and Dave Campbell will join me shortly for our Inside the World Series segment as we look ahead to what we can expect and what is expected to be a very close series. We'll also have the National Anthem, a look at the lineups for both teams, and then eventually, of course, send it up to the booth where John Miller and Joe Morgan are standing by to bring you Game 1 and all the games of the World Series right here on ESPN Radio. Tonight's game is brought to you by GMC Trucks and SUVs. We are professional grade. By the National Association of Realtors. Buying or selling a home? Ask your agent if they're a realtor, a member of the National Association of Realtors. And by New Extra Strength Roll 8 Soft Chews, chewy, not chalky, for a whole new kind of heartburn relief. Next, Dave Campbell will join me inside the World Series. It's next on the Baseball Tonight pregame show presented by Monroe. You're listening to Game 1 of the World Series on ESPN Radio. Hey, boss. Yes? You know how we save so much time with each free carrier pickup we get from the U.S. Postal Service? Oh, sure. Well, I figure we can save even more time by using initials. Uh -huh. So instead of saying free carrier pickup, we just say FCP. Right. It'll save us valuable seconds each week. Initials, huh? Like a G-O-O-M-O. -O -O. Exactly, sir. What does that stand for? Get out of my office. You catch on quickly, sir. Go to USPS.com today. Print labels, pay for postage, and request a free carrier pickup. It's simple, and it's free. Mr. Shatner, you claim Priceline saves you up to $100 a night off other leading sites. Oh, uh, yes, I do. Causing irreparable damage to my clients. The other sites? How can you make such allegations? When you name your own price, Priceline finds the hotel for you in your exact neighborhood and star level. The hotels then give us huge discounts, which we pass on to you. Uh, Your Honor, I seek a five-minute recess. To book a hotel, right? Priceline. Save like nowhere else. Exact hotels run only after purchase. With the longer nights this time of year, coupled with the wet winter weather, you can expect more hazardous driving conditions ahead. You need to get to AutoZone so you can see clearly and drive safely. Replace your burned out headlights, taillights, and turn signals, and put a new set of wiper blades on your car. Don't get a ticket or cause an accident. Get to AutoZone and drive safely. Get to the zone. AutoZone. Have you heard about Cherry Pepto-Bismol? Pink tastes even better than you think. For nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea. Yay! Cherry Pepto. Nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea. Yay! Cherry Pepto. Five stomach problems, one great taste. Use as directed. Pepto's gone cherry. And welcome back to U.S. Cellular Field, everybody. I'm Dan Schulman, and the starting pitchers are now out of the field, starting to do their stretching and loosening up. It's not going to be that long until we are underway here in Game 1. Time now for our look inside the World Series with Dave Campbell, brought to you by Priceline.com. Save up to $100 a night at hotels. Go to Priceline.com today. Soup, I know you and I were talking a little bit earlier. 
who knows who's going to win this series, but the style of play that is featured by both the White Sox and Astros is one that you and I, and we hope a lot of baseball fans, really enjoy. Yeah, I mean, I was reading today, I mean, and so many people know the old phrase in real estate, it's location, 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 and, but the Chicago Tribune columnist Mike Downey, who always has a good quip, said, this series is about pitching, rotation, rotation, and rotation. These two rotations are the best in baseball. They survive. It is about pitching. It's about situational hitting. It's about bunting, defense, managerial strategy. It's old-style baseball, and personally, I hope it's here to stay. There used to be a theory that there was an X-Cub factor in baseball. You'd look to see whoever had fewer X-Cubs, and they would win the World Series at the risk of alienating Northside fans who aren't too happy about this World Series being here on the South Side. What about the ex-Yankee factor looking at these two teams? Yeah, I mean, the New York Yankees, uh, Roger Clements, he walked away. He said he was going to retire. And they let Andy Pettit go. Then Andy Pettit signed with Houston. He talked Roger into going. The Yankees let Contreras and El Duque both go to the White Sox. Three of those guys are going to figure very prominently in this series, and who knows about El Duque? He came up huge in the division series. Let's talk a little bit about Roger Clemens. As a Texan, he helped get his Astros from his hometown into the World Series for the first time ever. He's 43. He's the oldest pitcher to ever start Game 1 of a World Series. From what you saw of him in the NLCS and what you know of him, what do you expect from him? Tonight? Well, he's going to come up big, and he'll be good in the early going. The only thing I worry about is the hamstring problem. We also saw him from about the fourth inning on lose a lot off his pitches. Gardner had to get him out after six, so I think you need to keep an eye on the hamstring. A lot of bunting, a lot of running, a lot of station-to-station, -station exciting one-run baseball. Well, that's what we expect. I mean, it expects to be a low-scoring game. I mean, you never know in baseball. It could be 11-10, but it sure doesn't figure that way on paper. No, both teams with outstanding pitching staffs and at times really struggled to score runs. Soup, thank you. We'll again talk to Dave Campbell after the game on our post-game show. When we come back, it'll be time for the National Anthem and a look at the lineups for both the National League and American League champs. That's all next on the Baseball Tonight pregame show presented by Monroe. The World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service, continues after these messages from your local station. If you like Italian food as much as I do, then let me tell you about the two best places to get it. Genovese's, 116 Dunlawton Avenue in the Shores, 767-4151, or Genovese's at 183 East Granada Boulevard, Ormond Beach, 677-3222, proudly serving you since 1981 with the best pizza, pasta, and salads anywhere. No pre-made frozen crusts or conveyor ovens here. Uh-uh, Genovese's makes everything fresh from scratch, the way it should be made, and delivers it hot and fresh right to you. And take my word for it, at Genovese's has the most authentic New York pizza south of the city. And there's spaghetti or ziti with marinara sauce and meatballs or sausage. Fettuccine Alfredo, chicken or eggplant parmesan are true Italian delicacies. That's Genovese's Italian Cafe, 116 Dunlawton Avenue in the Shores, 767-4151 or 183 East Granada Boulevard, 677-3222. Eat in, take out, or we deliver. Genovese's, limited delivery area. Where can you find the lowest mileage, cleanest pre-owned vehicles in Central Florida? At Sunrise on Ridgewood in Holly Hill. At Sunrise, you get all the advantages of new vehicles without the depreciation. That's right. Why pay the difference if you can't tell the difference? New car dealers offer 0% financing. So does Sunrise. New car dealers offer extended tours. So does Sunrise. New car dealers offer vehicles with factory warranties. So does Sunrise. All of Sunrise's vehicles come with their exclusive worry-free warranty. New car dealers offer zero down. So does Sunrise. New car dealers back their sales departments with state-of-the-art service departments. So does Sunrise. New cars and trucks depreciate up to 50% when you take them off the lot. Not at Sunrise. You buy like new vehicles after the depreciation. So at Sunrise, you'll not only get a great deal, but you'll get a great deal more. Stop by Sunrise on Richwood and Holly Hill today for the best selection of the nicest cars in Central Florida. At Sunrise, we're committed Committed to excellence. This is the World Series on ESPN Radio. Back here at U.S. Cellular Field in Chicago, I'm Dan Schulman back at field level right behind home plate. A chilly night here in Chicago as the non-starters, the reserves for both teams, have now made their way out into the baselines. The Astros wearing road gray up the first baseline. And the White Sox in their pinstripes on the third baseline. And a special introduction for one non-starter of the White Sox as Frank Thomas injured out with an ankle injury again. And who knows if he'll ever play for this team again. Getting 
a special extra loud and long ovation from the capacity crowd here at the U.S. Cellular Field. Got to be bittersweet for him, a little bit more sweet for Jeff Bagwell, who is playing and is in the starting lineup tonight. We are waiting for the introductions now of the starters as we will momentarily turn it over to the PA announcer here at U.S. Cellular Field in Chicago. Gene Honda is going to take us through the pregame ceremonies tonight leading up to the national anthem and then eventually the first pitch which will be called here on ESPN Radio by John Miller and Joe Morgan. The color guard is out on the field right now and it would appear that an enormous flag of the uh, Stars and Stripes is going to be unfurled out in center field momentarily. Flashbulbs are going off all around the ballpark here tonight as everybody waits. They've been waiting 46 years for the World Series to return to Chicago. At this point, we are now going to take you to the PA announcer, Gene Honda. First, the manager, number three, Phil Garner. The second baseman, number seven, Craig Biggio. Batting second, the center fielder, number one, Willie Tavares. Batting third, the left fielder, number 17, Lance Berkman. Up the third baseman, number 14, Morgan Ensberg. Batting fifth, the first baseman, number 26, Mike Lamb. Batting sixth, the designated hitter, number five, Jeff Bagwell. Seventh, the right fielder, number 16, Jason Lane. Batting eighth and warming up in the outfield, the catcher, number 11, Brad Osmus. Batting ninth, the shortstop, number 28, Adam Everett. Pitching for Houston and warming up in right field, number 22, Roger Clemens. And now let's welcome the manager and starting lineup for your American League champion, Chicago White Sox. Manager number 13, Ozzy Guillen. <laughs> Leading off the left fielder, number 22, Scott Pudsednik. <laughs> Batting second, the second baseman, number 15, Kalahito Iguchi. Fielder, number 23, Jermaine Dye. <laughs> Batting cleanup, the first baseman, number 14, Paul Konerko. <laughs> Batting fifth, the designated hitter, number 8, Carl Everett. <laughs> Batting sixth, the center fielder, number 33, Aaron Rowan. <laughs> Batting 
batting seventh and warming up in the bullpen, the catcher, number 12, A.J. Piersinski. Batting eighth, the third baseman, number 24, Joe Creedy. Ninth, the shortstop, number five, Juan Uribe. And pitching for the White Sox and warming up in the left field bullpen, number 52, Jose Contreras. Let's hear it for the Houston Astros and your Chicago White Sox. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please stand. Please you move your hats. Here tonight to honor America by performing our national anthem is multi-platinum reprise recording artist, Mr. Josh Groban. One of those moments we wish you could all be here with us. Some kind of anthem now. The fireworks going off above the outfield, and we are getting closer and closer to baseball as Dossie Gein and Phil Garner embrace at home plate. And now we'll head back to their dugouts. We are mere minutes away from the first pitch. More when we come back on the Baseball Tonight pregame show presented by Monroe. You're listening to the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. I'm worried that there are things that are going to burn me. I had to constantly be meeting people. Open house, that's somebody else's job. I figured I could sell it on my own to save a little bit of money. I don't even know enough to know that I don't know. The first thing we did was call a realtor. As soon as I saw that realtor R, he put me right at ease. If you're thinking about selling your home, you need some help. Ask your agent if they're a realtor, a member of the National Association of Realtors. For sale by owner, but not by this owner. A message from your local, state, and national realtor associations. Whether you're big or tall, or both, you know how hard it is to find clothes that fit you right. Unless you go to JCPenney, where you'll find a tremendous selection of big and tall clothes. From brands like Dockers, St. John's Bay, Van Heusen, and Arizona, made to fit you. Big and tall shops are in most larger JCPenney stores. And you can find a store near you at jcpenney.com. You can also shop online or by catalog. So save big and tall. It's all inside JCPenney. 
It's a line drive to the Xerox Work Center multifunction system. It scans at the first, prints the second, copies the third, the relay over the network, in color! Oh, what a play! I'll tell you, Jim, this Xerox Work Center C2424 does it all. Oh, yeah, it's got good speed, too. 24 color pages a minute, yet costs less than $3,000. That's <laughs> impressive. Yeah. Well, here we go again. The wind-up. The pitch. It's popped up, but Xerox Work Center is right there to take care of business. What an all-star. Hey, to learn more, visit Xerox.com slash office. <laughs> Unbelievable. I'm Keith Jackson with the Rose Bowl Classic Moment, brought to you by City. Credit cards and financial tools to help you live richly. It was a long time ago, but one of my favorite Rose Bowls. 1943, Frankie Sinkwich led number one ranked Georgia West to play UCLA in Bob Waterfield. Sinkwich, the first Heisman Trophy winner to play in Pasadena, hobbled by two sore ankles. Bulldog sophomore Charlie Trippi picked up the slack, gained 120 yards. Georgia beat the Bruins 9-0 as Sinkwich scored the game's only touchdown. This is the World Series on ESPN Radio. Welcome back to U.S. Cellular Field. A very nice moment here in Chicago. A number of players from the 1959 Go-Go White Sox, the last White Sox team to make the World Series, including Hall of Famer Luis Aparicio out of the mound. And Aparicio, a legend in Venezuela throughout the ceremonial first pitch, caught by fellow Venezuelan White Sox manager Ozzy Guillen. Folks, time now for our poll tonight. Make sure to log on to ESPNRadio.com to participate in our poll of the game. Tonight's question, who will win the World Series? And you've got four choices. I know there's only two teams. Astros in four or five, Astros in six or seven, White Sox in four or five, or White Sox in six or seven. Don't forget to log on to ESPNRadio.com to vote in our AutoZone poll question of the game, and we'll update the results later on in the broadcast. John Miller and Joe Morgan are standing by, ready to call Game 1 of the 2005 World Series, just a couple of minutes away now from tonight's first pitch. The World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service, continues after these messages from your local station. You will know what people are thinking on Mike and Mike in the Morning. Greg writes, Greeny, I love you, but please don't play the race card on the dress code for the NBA. There is a segment of the population, white, black, Latino, Asian, which is into the bling and hip-hop culture, and there is a segment of each of these races which does not like nor support the bling and hip-hop. Again, I look at this as they want you presented a certain way in the work environment. They're not telling you how to dress on your own time. Bill Curry. I would say to my teams when I was coaching, we're going to dress casually on this trip. Well, to them, that meant show up with a T-shirt that said, bite me in big letters. <laughs> okay? <laughs> so my coaches came to me and said, Coach, you're going to have to be specific with these guys. Michael Wilbon. This is where the league made its mistake 10 years ago. The league married itself to hip-hop. And it's fine. But the people who bankroll the NBA are the television networks and corporate sponsors. Period. And this is what Allen Iverson doesn't understand. He doesn't get it. You get Mike and Mike in the morning. Weekdays on ESPN Radio. What's on your radio dial? Perennial All-Star David Justice. My knock on the analyst, the players, is every time a guy hits a home run, it's a bad pitch. David, there were times a guy threw you 94 in and you pulled it out. 95% of the pitches that are hit for home runs are pitches that are off. But you're right. There are times a guy like Pujols might take a pitch off his shoelaces and hit it for a home run. And it's the responsibility of the analyst to say, this was not a bad pitch. What are you listening to? ESPN Radio. This week on NFL Sunday. Chad Johnson, how can a cornerback cover you? The best way is to understand down and distance and good camp. The upstart Bengals host the staggering Steelers. An out-of-conference matchup between the Chargers and the Eagles. And Dallas visits Seattle. Greg Ellis, Cowboy defensive end. Everybody say, well, the Cowboys don't talk, and they're going to dominate the rest of the division. Not guaranteed to be that way. Kickoff begins at 6 a.m. Eastern with a fantasy focus and lasts all day. NFL Sunday on ESPN Radio. This is the World Series on ESPN Radio. And welcome again to Field Level here in Chicago, U.S. Cellular Field, the home of the White Sox. Ozzie Gein and Phil Garner are out to exchange the lineup cards with our umpiring crew. Joe West is the crew chief here tonight, just a couple of minutes away from the first pitch of the first game of the 2005 World Series. I'll be back with you during the game and again at the postgame show. But for now, up to our broadcast team for the ball game tonight, John Miller and Joe Morgan. Fellas? All right, thanks very much, Dan. And welcome once again to the 101st World Series. And it is a matchup that has never occurred before. 
In fact, you've got one team that's never been to a World Series before. The Houston Astros, at long last, are in the Fall Classic. And a guy who was with the Astros in their early days, Joe Morgan, is my partner. And Joe, it must have seemed for a long time, like for those who were there at the very beginning of the Astros, like maybe this day would never come. Well, it, it, was, it was a long time coming, that's for sure. They've had some good players there and some good teams, but they were never able to get over the hump. So uh, this is a great day. matchup that will the people will enjoy I think we're going to be able to see more than just standing there waiting for the three run homer we're going to see a lot more action than we've seen in the last few World Series and as long as Astros fans have waited and uh, baseball fans in Texas have waited to see one of their own of the World Series it's been even longer for the Chicago White Sox the last time they were in the World Series the Houston Astros did not exist the White Sox were last in the series in 1959 we've got an intriguing pitching matchup. In fact, the first three games of this World Series will feature excellent pitching matchups. We're going to talk about the Game 1 matchup here in a moment, but now let's pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is the 2005 World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. You're on Daytona's Sports Source, 1380 WELE, Ormond Beach, Florida. Yes. been an electricity pulsing through what used to be called the new Comiskey Park and it is now called U.S. Cellular Field but they've had chance of let's go White Sox and just loud uh, rambunctious ovations for various White Sox and the uh, former White Sox we had uh, several of the 1959 White Sox who were here for the first ball ceremonies including Billy Pierce the left hander won 14 games for that team Bob Shaw a right hander who won 18 and little Louis himself for the go-go White Sox of 1959. Luis Aparicio threw out the first ball. Uh, Jungle Jim Rivera, J.C. Martin, and Jim Landis from that 1959 ball club were also here. The pitching matchup here in 2005, Jose Contreras, who was the ace of the staff, down the stretch, and including the postseason, he won the clinching game last Sunday in L.A. And for the Houston Astros, a guy who has all but earned his plaque in the Hall of Fame already. Seven-time Cy Young winner, 43-year-old Roger Clemens. And ironically, Joe, it is the first time that Clemens has ever started a game one in a World Series. Well, when he was with the Yankees, obviously he never started, and then with the Red Sox as well. So, But the interesting thing with Roger is that he has always been a guy that was available to start, but he wasn't used for some reason. So Clemens... Not only available, but in there as the White Sox take the field and they shoot off some fireworks here, which has always been a, a hallmark of White Sox baseball on the south side of Chicago since the days that Bill Beck built the old exploding scoreboard at the old Comiskey Park right across the street from this one. Let's take a look now at the batting orders once again. Brought to you by Xerox. In Big League Baseball, every star has to do it all. Now, you can do it all in the office with the Xerox Work Center C2424 multifunction system. Print, copy, and scan in Big League color. For the Houston Astros, it'll be the veteran Craig Biggio at second base leading it off. Willie Tavares, the rookie, in center field. Lance Berkman in left field, maybe all around the Astros' best hitter. Morgan Ensberg, the home run leader for the Astros and RBI leader this year, hits cleanup at third base. Mike Lamb, a left-handed hitter at first base. And for the first time since May the 4th, that's right, it's been five and a half months since Jeff Bagwell last started a big league game. And uh, back on May the 4th, after he had gone 0 for 5 in the game and decided it was time to have the surgery that he needed on his sh shoulder, he realized that maybe his big league career was over. But he got back in September, helped the ball club as a pinch hitter, and in the postseason in the same role. But in the designated hitter used in the American League, he's in the lineup, DH. Jason Lane had 26 home runs in right field. Brad Osmus, the veteran catcher, hits eight. And Adam Everett is the shortstop, batting ninth. For the White Sox, it'll be the base dealer, Scott Pesetnik, left field. Tata Iguchi, second base. Jermaine Dye, 31 homers, right field. Paul Canerco, MVP of the ALCS, first base. He had 40 homers this year. 
Carl Everett is the designated hitter, a former Astro. Aaron Rowan, center field. A.J. Brzezinski, the catcher, hitting seventh. Joe Creedy, he could well have been the MVP in the League Championship Series. Third base. And Juan Uribe, the shortstop, is batting ninth. And here we go. Craig Biggio steps to the plate. And he'll stand in against Jose Contreras. Contreras, a former Yankee, a former teammate of Roger Clemens in the Bronx. 15-7 and seven this year. Facing Clemens here tonight. And Contreras goes to work first. Biggio stands in. The first pitch of the 2005 World Series. A fastball for a call strike. Biggio, during the season, hit 264. 26 homers, 40 doubles, 69 runs batted in. Now here it comes, and a sinking fastball is too low. Contreras the pitcher, Prasinski the catcher, Konerko at first, Iguchi at second, Uribe at short, and Creedy at third. Pesednik at left, Rowan in center, die in right. Vigio crowds the plate, right-handed hitter, and he takes low again, ball two. Two and one. This ballpark built in a symmetrical configuration. 335 feet to the foul poles, 375 to the alleys, and 400 to straightaway center. And a fastball is too low. And it is 3-1. and one. <laughs> 53 degrees, the game time temperature. A little bit of a, a breeze blowing at 10 miles an hour. Here's the pitch. That fastball over the inside corner, strike two. And Biggio had taken a step toward first base. And that one caught the corner. Joe West is the home plate umpire and the crew chief for the World Series. Jeff Nelson at first. Jerry Lane at second. Daryl Cousins at third. Cedar Strom along the left field line. Hernandez the right field line umpire. The 3-2 pitch. Swing and a little bouncer hits softly towards short. Cutting in and over from third is Preeti on the run. Throws to first and gets him for one away. I think it's important for Contreras to keep these first two hitters off base, starting with Dijo and Tavares, because I don't think he can stop them from running if they choose to do so. He has a very slow delivery to the plate. So it's important for the White Sox to keep the first two guys off every time they come up. You got Dijo, 11 steals, but in the past, he's been a prolific base dealer when he was younger. But they will try to steal on Contreras because he has such a slow delivery. Now here is Tavares, and Tavares, who is an outstanding bunter, showed bunt and took that pitch too high for ball one. Creedy, who was playing him shallow at third base, came rushing in as soon as he saw Tavares indicate bunt. Here's the 1-0 pitch. Swing a chop on the third base side foul. Well, it's interesting, the third baseman Creedy plays in, but Conerco doesn't. And that's because it, most of the time when he bunts, he bunts down the third baseline. I think that's something he'll probably work on this winter. They play back on the right side and in on the left side because that's where he does most of his bunting. Now the 1-1 pitch. He bunts it, tries to drop it third base side, but bounces it foul off to the left. And now it is one ball and two strikes. This guy, Tavares, had a remarkable record this year. Whether he bunted or just hit a ground ball, he had a great chance to beat it out. He had something like 70-plus infield hits this year. Greedy backs up a bit at third. The pitch. The swing and a little pop fly behind second. Iguchi called off by Uribe and the shortstop Uribe has it. And that is out number two. Well, there's that fork ball, which is a devastating pitch. When he can get ahead of the hitters, they're going to have to deal with it. Well, he had him lunging at it. So he has kept those two would-be base dealers off base and here is Lance Berkman Berkman when the season began was on the disabled list and then when he finally got back he was not ready he had spring training during the season in effect but his final numbers ended up being pretty good 293 average 24 homers 82 batted in and he takes a fastball right down the middle strike one call this game is the first time that any Astros hitter has ever faced Contreras in a big league game. They may have seen him in a spring training game somewhere along the way. Shoot out nobody on. The shortstop Uribe playing well over toward the middle. Here's the pitch. And a 
change up that misses low and outside for a ball. One ball once I say change up, that might have been a fork ball, but it didn't do much for No, forking. it was a change up. That ball just kind of ran away and if didn't you, do a lot of sinking. Yeah, I can watch his motion. You can see there is a difference between the splitter, the fork ball, and the change up. Well, there's the fork ball swung on and missed. Strike two. Well, the one thing they want to do is, you know, try to keep from having to give Berkman a fastball in a fastball situation. He took the first fastball, but I think he was surprised because that was a very good fastball velocity-wise from Contreras. Two down, nobody on. The crowd on its feet. And the one-two pitch on the way. In the dirt with a fork ball. And a new ball will be put in play. The count now is two and two to Berkman. Contreras, whose only loss since the 1st of August was against the Angels in game one of the league championship series. Into his windup. The two and two pitch. Strike three call. And he got him with the off-speed pitch. Well, they want to stay away from the fastball, as I said, so we'll see a lot of that. Now the Rocket will head out to the mound. No score. The White Sox are coming up. It's game one of the 2005 World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. Top three reasons I'll be at Home Depot's end-of-season savings event. Well, number three is 30% off. you, you got to be kidding me. Come on. Number two is they're not kidding me. You, you get 30% off, you know. And the number one reason, it's, it's that whole 30% off thing again. Hurry in now to the Home Depot and get 30% or more off all Yellow Tag merchandise throughout the store. It's the end-of-season savings event only at the Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. Valid in U.S. only. See store for details. You're now seeing live pictures of a lunar mushroom. There are thousands marching on Washington as we... A generation as unique as this needs a new generation of personal financial planning. We are the personal advisors of Ameriprise Financial, formerly American Express Financial Advisors. To set up an appointment with a local financial advisor today, call 1-800-AMERIPRISE. That's 1-800-263-7477. Ameriprise Financial Services, member NASD and SIPC. Super Bowl 40 and the NFL Pro Bowl. They're the ultimate combo. And you could be there for both. It's the Lay's Playmaker Combo Challenge exclusively at your local Subway restaurant. When you buy a bag of Lay's potato chips as part of a Subway Fresh Value meal, look for the Lay's NFL code. Then log on to NFL.com to find out more about the Playmaker Combo Challenge. There'll be one Super Bowl 40 trip winner every week. And one lucky fan will win a trip to both Super Bowl 40 and the 2006 NFL Pro Bowl in Hawaii. Subway's a registered trademark of Doctors Associates and Copyright 2005. So how much horsepower is in your Sierra Heavy Duty pickup? Oh, it's not just horsepower. It's torque, too. What's so special about torque? Torque pulls you out of a ditch. Torque drives you up a mountain with a load of pipe. Torque calls your wife to tell her you'll be late because you and Torque are busy ripping stumps out of the ground. Wow, Torque sounds great. Yeah, I think you and Torque would hit it off. The Sierra Heavy Duty with 605 pound-feet of Torque. No matter how you use your GMC truck, we engineer them all to the highest standard. Professional grade. Torque number available when equipped with Thermax engine and Nelson transmission. Joe Morgan with you, ESPN Radio from the south side of Chicago, the 101st World Series. And now Roger Clemens, 341 regular season wins, takes the hill, and his first pitch fastball is over the inside for a called strike to Scott Pasednik. And right after that pitch came in, the catcher, Brad Osmus, stood up, turned to the plate up front, Joe West, and then pointed out to something in center field as if to say, hey, we got to something in her eyes out there and it might have been there's a uh, one of those script boards that shows animation just above the hitter's backdrop and it was showing Pasednik's name and had some lights flashing and whatnot uh, they have turned that off now so maybe that was uh, inadvertently left on now we're ready to play again Clemens into his wind up the pitch fastball is too high well people still think of Roger Clemens as a power pitcher but he really isn't He's a location pitcher now. He spots his ball very, very well, and when he goes upstairs with the fastball, it's for a purpose, but basically he keeps the ball down with his splitter and his slider. There's a fastball, popped up, foul off to the left, back into the second deck, out of play. Clemens had, in some ways, one of his best years ever this year. 
except he wouldn't know it to look at his one loss record. It was a rather ordinary 13 wins, 8 losses. Here's the 1-2 and two pitch. Look out. Fastball right toward the belt buckle of Pesednik. And the count goes to 2-2. Two and two. But his earned run average was 1.87. 211 innings pitched. Only 151 hits allowed. And only 11 home runs given up. A remarkable year for Clemens. But they got shut out nine times when he started. Now a fastball bounced to shortstop. Over to his left is Everett. He's got it near the bag. Slings it over to first. In time for the out of Pesednik is kept off the bases. And I would imagine, Joe, you were talking about keeping those first two guys in the Astros lineup off the bases. Pesednik is a guy the Angels could not keep off the bases the last two games in that series, and he hurt them. Well, he ended up getting a lot of walks, but he didn't really hurt them stealing bases. He hurt them by doing his job as a leadoff hitter and starting off the innings. But he, did, he wasn't able to take advantage of his speed by stealing bases, but I think he will be able to steal more rapidly or more effectively against the Astros. They don't have Benji Molina throwing behind the plate. Now here is Iguchi, the right-handed hitter, and a fastball is just off the outside for ball one. Iguchi, his first year in the United States, coming over from the, J the Japanese Pacific League, hit 278, 15 homers, 71, batted in. No score in the game, last of the first, one out, nobody on. Iguchi in an opened-up stance, feet wide apart. Roger Clemens winds, delivers, and a fastball at the knees for a strike. And you can see that Roger will stay down with most hitters. I'm watching him pitch to Pesednik, and he went a different route. He was throwing the fastball up, and then when he wanted to get the out, he went downstairs with a sinker. Other than that, I think he'll stay down on Iguchi unless he gets two strikes. Then he might go upstairs. 1-1 one, one pitch and a slider a little bit off the outside, and it is 2-1. Iguchi has not had a good postseason, but I, I really like him as a hitter. I liked his approach, but I think sometimes he gets caught up with trying to let Posetnik do his thing, and he forgets that, you know, he's a pretty good run producer himself. Jermaine Dye on deck, the pitch, and a fastball is grounded to third, fielded by Ensberg. His throw to first in plenty of time, and Iguchi is gone. Two down. Two down, nobody on. And Jermaine Dye comes up. The Astros have Clemens pitching. Brad Osmus, the catcher. Mike Lamb, first base. Craig Biggio at second. Adam Everett at shortstop. Morgan Ensberg, third base. Around the outfield. Lance Berkman in left. And Willie Tavares in center. And Jason Lane in right. Jermaine Dye, 31 homers this year. 86 runs battered in a 274 average. Clemens with a fastball in there for a called strike. Clemens and Dye have faced each other. And Dye has done fairly well against the Rockets. Six hits, 19 at-bats, including a home run. Two down, nobody on. A little bit of a breeze blowing out toward left as Dye lifts a high pop-up foul and out of play on the first base side. Coming over is Lamb and Biggio, but that ball is about eight or ten rows back out of play. Well, Rockets seem to be throwing well. He's throwing 92 to 94 miles an hour so he's staying above the 90 mile an hour range and that includes a sinker because a lot of times when you throw the sinking fastball your velocity goes down a little bit two down nobody on oh and two the count to Jermaine Dye Roger Clemens delivers fastball swung out and fouled back to the screen fastball and he kind of ran toward the inside part of the plate that time well, Clemens has certainly been here before. Most of the White Sox team has not been here before. This is the eighth World Series start in Roger Clemens' career. His last one was in Florida two years ago for the Yankees. Now the slider a little bit low and outside for a ball, one and two. And I remember that one, Joe. We all knew it was going to be his final batter, Luis Castillo. And you said it right here on ESPN Radio that he wanted to go out because we thought he was retiring. Yeah, we he wanted to go out with a strikeout, and he did. He got the strikeout and then got a big ovation for the big crowd in Miami that night. One-two pitch and a fastball low and outside, and it is two and two. Roger Clemens, he's 43 years old. His eighth World Series start. His record in the World Series is 3-0 and oh, with a 1.90 ERA. Two and two the count. Konerko would be next. Here's the pitch. 
fastball foul back to the screen again. So die hanging tough here against the Rocket. Two and two the count. Clemens got his most notoriety in this postseason. Not for a game he started, but for rather a game he came on in relief. That 18-inning classic against Atlanta. He pitched the final three innings scorelessly. Four strikeouts and got the win. Now, there's that sinker you're talking about, and that's low and inside for a ball. I say sinker. That might have been the, the splitter. No, that was a sinker. Three and two the count. This is the eighth pitch now of the sequence. The pitch to die. Grounded. Foul. Third base side over to the White Sox dugout. And it is three and two. But Clemens will have to try it again. He is blowing on his right hand. The plate umpire, Joe West, when the game began, indicated that because of the, the cool temperatures this evening, pitchers would be allowed to touch their hand to their mouths while on the mound. 3-2 pitches, a high drive in the right field. Way back there, Jason Lane to the wall. Goodbye, a home run. And the White Sox take a one to nothing lead. Well, I think Dye got himself in a position where Clemens didn't want to walk him. And he threw him a fastball, and Dye wasn't early on it, but he hammered it to right field, and the ball traveled well in the area where he hit it. And he gives the White Sox a one to nothing lead. And that got out of here with plenty to spare into the visiting bullpen and to the back wall of the bullpen, which is behind the right center field wall. One to nothing, the White Sox lead. And the 31 home run man has been heard from. Now the 40 home run man comes up. Paul Konerko, and a fastball comes inside. Now, that was the ninth pitch of the at-bat. It was a fastball on the outside, and it really took off. And as Dye was rounding the bases, Roger Clemens went in and had a conversation with the plate umpire, Joe West. Yeah, I think it's about the baseballs and whether they're rubbed up or not. There's a fastball outside, and it is 2-0. Because he's changed balls a couple of times. But I think what he's probably going to end up doing is wetting his tip, fingertips as well as blowing on his hand. Juanota Conurco, the MVP in the American League Championship Series. The pitch is low, 3-0. Well, Jermaine Dye has seen Clemens in the past, so he knows what to expect. And that's the second home run he's hit against Clemens in 20 at bats. Konerko has seen him. He's 8 for 18, a 444 lifetime average. He's already got two home runs against the Rocket. 3 0 pitch, and that's a sinker that comes back over the outside for a strike. 3 and 1. One to nothing. The White Sox lead. The White Sox, who displayed more power during the season than did the Astros, they hit 200 home runs. The Astros hit 161. 3-1 pitch. Fastball just over the outside corner. And Konerko started to go to first base. And then a little bit of a delayed call there by Joe West. And it is 3-2. And, and that one had a little action coming back to the outside. Yeah, I guess Konerko just thought it missed. And Joe West thought he got the outside edge. I'm sure though that will not be the only time tonight we'll have a disagreement. <laughs> Three and two the count. Adam, here's a swing and a foul back out of play. Started to say Adam Everett, Carl Everett, the White Sox Everett is on deck. Adam Everett is the shortstop for the Astros. So three and two, the count to Conerco. Another battle going here. It was on the ninth pitch of the the epic that die connected for the home run and i've got another long at bat going here with Konerko. the 25th pitch of the inning coming on 3-2 pitch swung on grounded a short right to adam everett he sets himself throws to first in time and the inning is over Konerko retired but a run on the die homer and the white Sox go ahead morgan ensberg mike lamb and jeff bagwell coming up for houston one to nothing chicago the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service, continues after these messages from your local station.
Tire City, Volusia County's largest tire warehouse, has the names you know and trust. Pirelli's, Goodyear, Michelin, BF Goodrich, Cooper, and more, with discounted prices on new and used tires. Tire City, family-owned for 15 years, has brake specials, mufflers, and CV axles. Fuel injector service, $59.99 for most cars. Buy four new or used tires and get a free oil change. That's Tire City, muffler and repair shop, 1178 South Nova Road, Ormond Beach, 677-0160. Tire installation while you wait, open six days a week at Tire City. Daytona Dogs, serving Chicago-style hot dogs and more. Try these taste-tempting Vienna hot dogs, jumbo dogs, Italian beef or sausage, Polish sausage, and steak burgers are some of the many dogs Daytona Dogs serves. Next time you're in a mood for the taste that made Chicago famous, stop on into Daytona Dogs. Proud supporters of the Chicago White Sox. Go Sox! Located on West International Speedway Boulevard, Daytona Beach, half mile past the racetrack. Call today for takeout at 258-9200, 258-9200. Are you hot under the collar? Well, keep your cool with Tropical Auto Air with two convenient locations to serve you better. 1092 South Ridgewood Avenue, Edgewater, and 700 South Nova Road, Daytona. Tropical Auto Air offers a free 20-point service check, including belts, hoses, fluids, and more. We also offer a free air conditioning and heating check and a free brake inspection. Radiator flush on most cars starting at just $34.95. Tune-ups and radiator flush just $54.95 for most cars. CV axles at just $89. 95 for most cars. Timing belt specials only 99.95 for most cars. And if your engine light is on and you have engine trouble, Tropical Auto Air offers a free diagnostic check. We have complete auto repair with fully ASC certified factory trained mechanics on both foreign and domestic. Also factory trained import specialists for Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. For all your auto repair needs, it's Tropical Auto Air. 1092 South Ridgewood Avenue, Edgewater, 428-3787 and 700 South South Nova Road, Daytona, 226-2070. John Miller, Joe Morgan back with you on ESPN Radio from Chicago. One to nothing, the White Sox are leading. And fans log on to ESPNRadio.com to ask Joe Morgan your Equifax question of the game. It's easy. Click the Equifax question of the game link and submit your question. If your question is answered on the air, you will receive an ESPN Radio gift pack. You ever got one of those, Joe? No. I mean, you're the one answering the question. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but we only give the gift pack if you ask the question. Here's a first pitch fly ball by Morgan Ensberg, the Astros cleanup hitter, out into medium deep right under it near the warning track. Die, and he's got it. And there is one away. Ensberg had not been swinging the bat well the last, what, two, three weeks since he got hit by a pitch. Well, I think they're going to need him, too. I think the way this offense is built, they're going to need him and Berkman to have a good series if they're you know, going to beat the White Sox. I don't think the White Sox are going to be as dependent on any two players as much as the Astros are. Here now is Mike Lamb, a left-handed hitter. He's got some power and a high fastball, a little bit too high, apparently, from Jose Contreras. Ensberg had 36 home runs during the regular season to lead the Astros, but he has not hit any home runs in the postseason, although he's driven in a lot of runs. This is swing, and Lamb drives one into deep center field. Rowan going back, still going back, still going back, and that ball is a home run. This game is tied. Mike Lamb hits one out of the yard to center field to the right of straightaway, and it is one to one. So Lamb launches one, and that way, that's why he's in there. Lamb had 12 home runs this year and 322 at bats. Well, one of the things we talked about is that this being a throwback kind of series where guys bunt, hit and run, etc. But guess what? These Both of these teams still rely a lot on power, and obviously the first two runs scored on home runs. The White Sox still, you know, score most of their runs through by the home run, and so do the Astros. Now Jeff Bagwell, and a swing and a foul right back to the screen. Jeff Bagwell in his first World Series, along with his uh, running mate of so many years, Craig Biggio, Bagwell and Biggio, and for a long time, they have been the signature names of the Houston Astros. Bagwell down in a deep crouch, feet wide apart, that familiar stance, and there's a slider in there from Contreras, strike two call. Well, they're two completely different type players, though. Bagwell has been the most valuable player in the league. I mean, he was one of the true great power hitters of his era. And, I mean, just one of the best hitters in the game at the height of his career. Now the 0-2 pitch. 
Look out. That's a breaking ball high and tight, and that hit him. Bagwell lurched back away from it, and uh, apparently that ball just barely got a, a, a piece of him. I'm not sure that Bagwell was even sure of it himself. I don't think the ball hit him, but it was close. It was I a mean, fork ball, not a fast ball. He did not act like he had no. been a hit. No. In fact, he just stood there, and then the, the plate up president, you go to first base. Yeah. But it was close. So I guess it could have ticked the uniform. But watching the in-house replay, it did not appear that the ball hit him, but could have touched the uniform. One to one the score, and here is Jason Lane. Right-handed hitter, and a sidearm sinker is low for ball one. Mike Lamb is the 29th player in World Series history to hit a home run in his first World Series at bat. One ball and no strikes to Jason Lane. One to one the score. Here's the stretch and the pitch. There's a liner down the left field line. That's looking toward the corner. That is a foul ball. One ball and one strike down the count to Jason Lane. And Bagwell will go back to first. Now listening to Ozzie again today talk about Contreras, and I'm watching him. Every right-handed hitter, he kind of drops down a little bit more. And then when he wants to throw the fork ball, he actually gets three quarters to up on top. I haven't seen him throw a sidearm slider except once in the three games that I've watched him pitch. So when he drops down, it's usually a sinker. A ball and a strike to Lane. Brad Osmus on deck. Canerco on the bag with Bagwell at first. Here's the pitch. Swing and a ground ball to short. Sh should be two. Uribe to second one. Iguchi to first. Two. A double play. And the inning is over. But Lamb homers to tie the game. Carl Everett coming up with the White Sox. It is one to one after one and a half. And this is game one of the 2005 World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. Presenting Carol, who's about to retire. She's been called hippie. Right on, man. Preppy, yuppie, protester, Democrat, Republican, mom. Can I borrow the car, mom? Ah, uh, no. CFO, CEO. And now I'd like to introduce our first female chief executive. Cancer patient, cancer survivor, fundraiser, spokesperson. Thank you. Journalist, and soon to be world traveler. Reaching retirement is no small achievement. We'll help you make the most of it, because if you're anything like Carol, you're probably going to need more income than you imagined. Fidelity Retirement Income Advantage. We'll help you develop an income plan, figure out what investment products may be right for you, and then help simplify and manage all of your income and expenses from one account. Is your retirement on track? Find out in about 30 minutes. Call today, 1-800-FIDELITY. Fidelity Investments. Smart move. Fidelity Brokerage Services. Member NYSE SIPC. I play four instruments. Five, including my car. James Smith, Max Light Motor Oil user. This car is a 91, with 93,000 miles. I like to keep it running good and sounding sweet. My engine used to sound terrible. I put Max Life Oil in, and it runs smooth and strong. The Avaline Max Life Motor Oil has added ingredients that reduce wear and engine noise. At 75,000, time to switch to Max Life. So you had the big meeting yesterday. The boss was cranky from six hours on the red eye. Dan left the presentation in the cab, and you sat on a four-inch window ledge for 90 minutes. Next time, web conference with Microsoft Office Live Meeting, and have a more productive meeting without leaving your office. Present to clients around the globe, collaborate in real time, even get instant feedback by taking a live poll. Try it free for 14 days at Microsoft.com slash work live. That's Microsoft.com slash work live, or call 1-877-MEET-WEB today. Last half of the second inning in the 2005 World Series, Game 1 on ESPN Radio. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. On the 30th anniversary of one of the great World Series ever played, Game 7 was 30 years ago tonight at Fenway Park. The Reds and the Red Sox and my partner Joe Morgan knocked in the winning run of that game and as it turned out of that World Series. There's a swing and a miss by Carl Everett on a high fastball from Clemens. So, so Joe, happy anniversary. I didn't know it, but thank you very much. I mean, and apparently, by all accounts, you just 
drilled that ball. Well, I drilled a lot of balls that day. There's a, <laughs> a high fastball that misses to Everett. One ball, one strike. Most of them were foul, but that one counted. Although Kurt Gowdy on ESPN Classic described it as a looper in the center field. Here's the pitch. Swing a line drive up the middle. Or sorry, a looper. A looper, a looper. See, up the middle. Yeah. Base hit for Everett in the center field. But I guess you could describe it that way. <laughs> I wouldn't argue with him. Well, I'm just going by what you've been telling me for all these years. Yeah, I wouldn't argue with him. I heard it was a line shot. What's the old saying? They don't draw pictures on the score for. <laughs> well, that was 30 years ago today. What a World Series that was. It was after the game six that saw... And that was one of the great World Series games of yeah, all time. That individual game was unbelievable. You might have enjoyed Game 7 a little bit more personally. Yeah. Well, no one gave me a, any kudos for the ball that Dwight Evans caught. I hit that one well. Yeah. So. Oh, that double play ball you hit? Yeah. So yeah. you see, your double play ball, you'd be better off getting a looper for a base hit than you are <laughs> having a guy make a spectacular play and turning it into a double play. Crush that ball. And, I mean, here it... Oh, it'd be been gone new, here. The new Comiskey would have been back halfway yeah. up in the bleachers oh, out yeah. there. Here is Aaron Rowan. Carl Everett at first after his single. The pitch to Rowan and a slider from Clemens low and outside for ball one. It's that old saying, Johnny, would have gone any place but the place we were playing. <laughs> <laughs> but that's true. Yeah. Fenway 302 feet to the pesky foul pole along the right field line. And then he hit it about 20 feet off the foul line. And he hit it, hit it 380 feet. Aaron Rowan, during the season, he had 13 homers, 69 batted in. With a 270 batting average. One to one, the score. There's a throw to first, and Everett is back to the bag. I think they have to do something to try to disturb Clemens. And, I, and you're going to have to hit and run. You're going to have to send some runners. You're going to have to do something. And I think you do it early in the game to find out what you can and can't do with Osmus behind the plate. Now the pitch to Rowan, and he swings and he bounces one foul back behind the plate. One ball, one strike. Although Clemens is working very hard to keep Everett from getting a good lead at first and getting a good jump. Each team has hit a home run. Jermaine Dye hit a home run in the first inning with two down to the opposite field for the first run of the game. And then Mike Lamb the homer to center field with one out in the second inning to tie the game. One to one, last of the second. Here's the pitch. Rowan takes a little bit inside for a ball. And I watched Everett at first base. He had a great jump on that particular play. And he didn't go. He timed Clemens perfectly on that particular pitch. A.J. Przinsky on deck, a left-handed hitter. So Clemens toes the first base side of the slab. He got the ball on the glove, his right hand dangling next to his right leg. Now he brings his hands together right under his chin. There goes Everett. The pitch is bounced to the right side and right through the wide open hole. A base hit. Carl Everett goes over to third base easily on the brilliantly executed hit-and-run ground ball by Rowan with the second baseman Biggio breaking to cover second base. And that right side was vacant. A base hit, first and third, nobody out. And, I, and that's what I'm talking about. I think that's what you have to do with Roger Clemens. If you let him settle in and just pitch, you may not have a chance to score runs unless you hit the ball out of the ballpark. But if you get runners on, you can disrupt his timing and his rhythm by hitting and running, trying to steal a base, just to make him more aware of the base runner than he is of the hitter. And that was perfectly executed there, as you mentioned, by Rowan. But I thought that Everett had a great jump anyway. And he got Przinsky, what's great for the White Sox because of the execution on that. Przinsky's a real threat to hit a double play ball, number one. A real threat. But also, a double play now, you get a run. Well, the key is he has to put the ball in play. And he steps out of the box, granted timeout. Clemens was not aware of it. He was looking elsewhere in his set position. And uh, although West had walked away from the plate, Pazinski had backed away. Clemens spun and then started to throw the pitch and actually lobbed one in there. And he also said something to Pazinski. He, he I, I don't know what he asked, whether he asked him if he called timeout or whatever, but he said something for... Now a splitter to Brzezinski, and that is too low for ball one. It hit the dirt, and a new baseball will be set out to the rocket. 
So Przinsky could get a, the go-ahead run home with a ground ball double play. A fly ball could do it. Clemens, number one, I think, would like to get the strikeout. And then the double play. But he's behind him now. One ball and no strikes. Here it comes. Fastball popped up foul. And out of play off to the left. Back behind the White Sox dugout into the lower deck. And a good fastball in under the hands. But the, the guy that's hitting with first and third or the base low with no one out, he's the key guy. Because if he puts the ball in play, you're more than likely going to score a run, as you said, even if you hit a ground ball, double play. But if he strikes out and the next guy hits into the double play, obviously you don't get any runs. So that's what you have to be careful of. Everett at third, Rowan at first. Now Clemens kicks toward third, spins and bluffs toward first. But they've got to be thinking that, well, what if Rowan takes off here? I think that was a good idea there by Clemens, just to let him know that you can't just take off because I may, you know, fake the third and come back to first. And that will slow the runner at first base in this situation. A ball and a strike to A.J. Przinsky. Joe Creedy is on deck. The middle infielders double play depth. Here's the pitch. Look out, high and tight. And Przinsky gets sort of a sarcastic smile on his face and kind of stares out at Clemens after that high tight pitch. Well, you figured it might come simply because, you know, Rocket was caught in the middle of his pitch a while ago and, and, and Przinsky stepped out. And I said that he was saying something to, to Przinsky. I don't know exactly what he was saying, obviously, but he did say something. 2-1 pitch. There's a slider. One hopper to first. It's fielded there by Lamb. He looks the runner at third and throws to second for the out, at which point Everett breaks for the plate. He scores. They get the force out at second, but Everett comes in to score. Lamb looked at him and thought, apparently, that he had frozen him and went ahead and threw to second as Everett then did come in to score. And it was excellent base running play by Everett because he did stop to keep them from forcing him at the plate. And by the time he turned to throw the second, he just took off, and there was no chance for Everett to come back home. So excellent base running there by Everett. And that, that's one of the things I think gives the White Sox an edge in this series is that they are more aggressive on the bases. They know how to run the bases. They will run into some mistakes, but they're always going to be aggressive, and that always helps you when you're facing a good pitcher. I mean, Lamb has either just got to go ahead and go after Everett or try and start the double play. Well, I, I actually thought he did the right thing. Again, I, I, I'm going to give Everett more credit than I am going to be blamed for Lamb. I think he stopped him, and then he threw the second. A lot of times the runner will stay at third, and then you still have the double play in order to get out of it. But I, it was just an excellent play, as far as I'm concerned, by Everett because he, after he stopped, he started again quickly when he turned. But you're right, I mean, you can, I don't think you can take just the one out at first because you end up first and third again anyway if you get him in a rundown. Now Joe Creedy swings and foul tips one into the glove of Brad Ausmus. Two to one, the White Sox are back ahead. But, I mean, if you freeze that runner at third, you've got to take note of where he is at third base, yep. right? Yeah. If, he's, if he's 30 feet down the line, I mean, that's not exactly freezing him close to the bag. But he wasn't far enough of, off the bag where he could throw to third, though. So I think that's the problem. The one strike pitch, and Clemens has it in there. Strike two call. If he just takes that play, the ball lamb, and then tries to throw to third, he would not have gotten Everett. The long throw would have given Everett time to get back because he did freeze. Like I said, it was a tough call for Lamb. I, I, think he, I actually think he did the right thing, but Everett just, you know, did, made a better base running play. On to the count, here it comes, and a fastball is off the outside. One ball and two strikes. Now, they're also making the Rockets throw a lot of pitches early here. Exactly. Well, but the White Sox, I, I, look, I, I like the way they play the game, but I also think that Houston, you know, can play with them because of their starting pitching. One ball, two strikes. Here's Clemens to the plate. A broken bat roller toward third. Rushing into field at his Ensberg. His throw to first pulls Lamb off the bag, but he tags Creedy coming by for the putout as Przinsky moves to second base. And now from this angle up here, John, it looked like the barrel of that bat was going toward Ensberg. And I, you know, I, it, it was surprising for me to see him really just go get the ball because it appeared to me that the barrel of the bat was going toward third baseman. But luckily for him, it was down the line a little bit more. So two down, a run in. Brzezinski, the runner at second, and here is Juan Uribe. 
And it was interesting before the game hearing his manager, Ozzy Guillen, talk about Uribe as a hitter. Yeah, well, it's interesting because when you look at his batting average, he hasn't been that great except for driving in runs. Here's the pitch. And a ground ball pulled foul on the third base side, all in one. And he has a chance, obviously, to drive in some runs here. I mean, he has been a very good guy in the RBI situations for him. And as you're mentioning, Ozzie Gians thinks that he should be a really, really good hitter. And maybe he will be. But he thinks he's got a quick bat. He's got a lot of positive things as far as the batter's box is concerned. He said he thought the only guy in the league with a quicker bat than him is Gary Sheffield. There's a splitter, lined left center field into the alleyway, base hit, it rolls to the wall. Coming around third, Krasinski, he scores easily, Uribe into second, a stand-up double, and the White Sox lead 3-1 to one now. Well, this is what he's done all year long, he's been a good RBI man in these situations. I mean, for you to hit eighth or, and down in order and to drive in runs as he did during the season means that you're a good clutch hitter. Clemens tries to throw him a splitter. It, it sinks a little bit and looking on the monitor, but it's pretty good hitting there by Uribe because he just took it up the gap in left center field. And the fans here in Chicago are in a chanting mood now. And remember, all this was kind of set up by the hit and run. You know, by hitting and running, you got runners at first and third automatically with no outs early in this inning. And again, I, I feel like if you're going to face Roger Clemens, you can't let him just sit out there and get comfortable because he will mow you down. The pitching coach, Jim Hickey, out to the mound to speak to Roger Clemens. Clemens has already passed 40 pitches in this game, and he's allowed three runs in these first two innings. And Uribe is one, the one guy who really hit the ball well in this inning. I mean, Everett hit a solid single to center, but then you, Rowan just hit a little chopper in the right side on the hit and run. Krasinski and Creedy hit ground balls. Creedy's bat exploded, but Uribe hit a shot into the gap. Now here's the leadoff, Matt Pesednik, with a chance to knock in another run. It is 3-1 Chicago in the second inning. Pesednik grounded out to short his first time. Clemens into his stretch, delivers. And a slider in there for a called strike. This inning kind of reminds me of the inning we saw Mike Messina have against Anaheim and the Angels in the game five. They were just one here, one there. They were finding holes, but it all added up to three runs. The Sednik, left-handed batter, the pitch to him. And a swing and a miss. And to the count. The Astros' bullpen gets busy, and the young left-hander, Wandy Rodriguez, has started to warm up now as Clemens has struggled in these first two innings, giving up three runs and four hits. And I think part of the problem, John, is he has not been able to keep the ball down consistently. 0-2 pitch, and a splitter is too low on outside for a ball. One ball and two strikes. He threw 25 pitches in the first inning and has thrown 21 more here in the second inning so far. Iguchi on deck. He would be next. Uribe leads away from second. Clemens delivers. Fastball up and away for a ball. Two and two. Talking about Uribe. He only hit 252 during the season, but he had 71 runs battered in but in this postseason Uribe is hitting 333 with a homer three doubles and five runs battered in so he has shown himself to be the kind of a hitter in the postseason that Ozzie Gann thinks he could be there's a swing and a pop-up foul third base side and that goes back out of play and remember they got Uribe from the Colorado Rockies for a a young longtime minor leaguer named Aaron Miles who's been a, a good player for Colorado. He's a useful player. But Uribe's got a chance to be a star. I just love the way he plays shortstop, and I've said that throughout the playoffs. I mean, he's got great footwork, quick release, and a very strong and accurate arm. Two and two the count. Clemens will try it again. Here it comes. Fastball lunged at and foul right back to the screen. Still two and two. And you have to give Ozzie Guillen a lot of credit, I think, for 
the development of Uribe. Yeah. Well, I, I think you, you have to give him a lot of credit for the development of a couple of guys. Contreras, for one, and also Uribe because, you know, he told Contreras, just go win, just go pitch. 2-2 two, two pitch. Fastball to the inside. And a little bit off the corner, 3-2. and two. They've been working him away and then ran that one inside with a little movement back toward the plate, but it stayed off the inside. And I think if Roger will tell you that his command and his location is not as good tonight as it normally is. Three and two the count. Runner in second, the pitch. And a splitter is swung on and fouled. A foul tip that also hit off the edge of the glove of the catcher, Osmus. So Posednik is still alive. Three and two. Three to one, White Sox leading the Astros here in the second. And this will be the ninth pitch of this at back to Posednik upcoming. Die hit the ninth pitch he saw in the first inning for a home run. Uribe leads from second. 3-2 pitch. Fastball is swung on. A high fly ball along the left field line. And that one is twisting foul and back in amongst the spectators. Two or three rows back out of play as the left fielder Berkman was giving chase. And it's kind of interesting. This is a cool night. And Contreras has been in the dugout for quite a while now. Contreras has been more like a viewer in this game than a, a participant. Three and two the count. Clemens delivers. Fastball popped up. Foul. Off to the left. And that's going to go back out of play. So this marathon at bat goes on. That was the tenth pitch thrown by Clemens to Pesednik. Uribe leads from second. Three to one, the White Sox lead. The outfield pushed toward the left field side a bit. Clemens delivers. Fastball swung on and fouled. Back out of play again. Off to the left of the plate. Three and two. I would think that this kind of an at-bat has got to be part of the job description for a good leadoff man. Yeah, no doubt. And you'd like to have this in the first inning, though, so that your teammates can see how much his fastball is moving and et cetera. 3-2 pitch. And he struck it out with a high fastball. He swung at ball four. And the inning is over. A 29-pitch inning for Roger Clemens. Two more runs. And it is 3-1. The White Sox lead after two. The World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service, continues after these messages from your local station. If you like Italian food as much as I do, then let me tell you about the two best places to get it. Genovese's, 116 Dunlawton Avenue in the Shores, 767-4151, or Genovese's at 183 East Granada Boulevard, Ormond Beach, 677-3222, proudly serving you since 1981 with the best pizza, pasta, and salads anywhere. No pre-made frozen crusts or conveyor ovens here. Uh-uh. Genovese's makes everything fresh from scratch the way it should be made and delivers it hot and fresh right to you. And take my word for it. At Genovese's has the most authentic New York pizza south of the city. And there's spaghetti or ziti with marinara sauce and meatballs or sausage. Fettuccine Alfredo, chicken or eggplant parmesan are true Italian delicacies. That's Genovese's Italian Cafe, 116 Dunlawton Avenue in the Shores, 767-4151 or 183 East Granada Boulevard, 677-3222. Eat in, take out, or we deliver. Genovese's, limited delivery area. Where can you find the lowest mileage, cleanest pre-owned vehicles in Central Florida? At Sunrise on Ridgewood in Holly Hill. At Sunrise, you get all the advantages of new vehicles without the depreciation. That's right. Why pay the difference if you can't tell the difference? New car dealers offer 0% financing. So does Sunrise. New car dealers offer extended terms. So does Sunrise. New car dealers offer vehicles with factory warranties. So does Sunrise. All of Sunrise's vehicles come with their exclusive worry-free warranty. New car dealers offer Offer zero down. So does Sunrise. New car dealer.
dealers back their sales departments with state-of-the-art service departments. So does Sunrise. New cars and trucks depreciate up to 50% when you take them off the lot. Not at Sunrise. You buy like new vehicles after the depreciation. So at Sunrise, you'll not only get a great deal, but you'll get a great deal more. Stop by Sunrise on Richmond and Holly Hill today for the best selection of the nicest cars in Central Florida. At Sunrise, we're committed to excellence. The pitch and a fastball lined into right field, a base hit. So Osmus with a solid single to right, and he was one of the heroes in that 18 inning game. In fact, without Osmus, it wouldn't have gone 18 innings. They would have lost it in nine and had to go to Atlanta the next day for a deciding game. But he hit a two out home run in the ninth inning against uh, Kyle Farnsworth to tie that game. And he was also the big guy in game five in the uh St. Game six in St. Louis as well. I mean, he got three base hits. He started off three rallies for them, so he's been hot down the stretch. Here's Adam Everett, three to one, the White Sox lead, and Everett takes a called strike from Contreras and it is 0-1. Adam Everett, a right-handed hitter, with a 248 average during the season, 11 home runs, 54 batted in. He's another guy who can steal the a base for. You. He had 21 steals during the season. By the way, Osmus had that big game against the Cardinals the other night, three-hit game you're talking about, and he was sick as a dog. I mean, to, to sort of use an expression. Yeah, I was going to say me. <laughs> There's a light <laughs> down the, the left field line. It's foul and back into the first row of the seats along the line. And it is I mean, let's just put it, he was very, very, very sick. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, feverish yeah. with flu-like symptoms. And uh, Phil Garner told us that he said to him, said, listen, when the game's over, I mean, you can die. You know, we'll pay for the funeral and everything. We'll, we'll all come and we'll say prayers and whatnot. But you've got to, you got to stay in there and give me nine. And he did, and he gave him a good nine. Here's the 0-2 pitch. Swing and a line drive, foul again down the left field line. And Everett apparently cracked his bat on that one, so he heads toward the dugout. And the bat boy comes out with a new piece of wood for him, and that gives us a chance Joe and I would like to extend a special welcome to all of our U.S. servicemen and women stationed around the world and on ships at sea and many in harm's way listening to tonight's game on the American Forces Radio Network. And welcome to the broadcast. And our thoughts and best wishes are with you and our sincere appreciation. On to the count to Everett with a new piece of wood now. He crowds the plate. Contreras throws. And a slider round, rounded right back to Contreras. He throws the second one. Uribe to first. Not in time. Everett was already well past the bag by the time the throw got to first. Well, what happened there was Contreras did the right thing. He made sure of one. He made sure he got the lead, uh, lead runner. He took an extra beat just to make sure he gave an accurate throw. And that's where you lose the double play. But you want to make sure you get the one first. And, I mean, when you watch Uribe at second base, I mean, he does things with his glove that are just magical. He catches everything pretty much one-handed, but he brings the glove over and transfers it very quickly. Lead off back, Craig Biggio now. There's a throw to first, back to the bag is Everett. By the way, in the Astros' bullpen, we had told you that Wandy Rodriguez, the young lefty, had been up starting to get warm while Clemens was struggling in that second inning and Rodriguez has stayed up here in the third inning so maybe Clemens is finished here's the pitch to Biggio there's a swing and a miss John Strike every, one. everyone says that you know Roger Clemens hamstring is okay and he's not going to use that as an excuse but he has not been the same pitcher since he injured the hamstring and the one thing about your legs he uses his legs to drive and if you're not sure about him, you're not driving the same way you were earlier in the year. And so I definitely believe that the hamstring has had an effect on his pitching lately. Here's the one-strike pitch to Biggio. And a swing and a miss, strike two. Biggio grounded back to third his first time. Three to one, the White Sox lead. Game one of the 2005 World Series coming to you on ESPN Radio. The Biggio behind on the count 0 and 2. Biggio, 39 years old, the oldest position player to make his World Series debut as a starting player. And we're not talking about pitchers. 
but he's 39 years old and almost 40 making his first start in a World Series the pitch low and outside for a ball one ball two strikes now to Craig Biggio Biggio closing in on 3,000 hits in his career and he's been a catcher a second baseman a center fielder a left fielder and this year he was a he was an outfielder at the start of the year and then went back to second base finally there goes the runner from first and the ball is swung on and blew foul off to the right and it ends up just behind the Astros dugout of the first to second row. And Everett had an excellent jump because again Contreras is very deliberate to the plate and Everett got a good jump from first base and I like to see that if you're the Astros you can't just wait for the big inning. Everett's one of the guys that can steal a base for you. Let him go ahead and steal it and try to get in the scoring position. I mean the way it started in this game you have a feeling right now anyway I might be wrong but the three runs may not be enough to win it for the White Sox. Contreras ready. Here it comes. A slider swung on. Punched into shallow center. That's falling. That's in there. Base hit. One hop. And into the glove of the onrushing Rowan. Stopping at second is Adam Everett. So Craig Biggio. I mean those first two pitches. He had the weakest looking swings imaginable. His one contact was a little bloop off to the right. But then he ends up getting the base hit. Well it just shows you the difference in location. The first two were sliders down. That was a slider was up and he just fought it off. So that's the problem. If he would have gotten the pitch down, I'm sure he could have, you know, gotten away with it. But when you get the ball up and a hanging slider to the good hitters, they're going to fight the ball off, as Craig did. So the Astros has something uh, started here. And here is Willie Tavares. One thing Tavares, as a rookie, did a lot of good things for him. He stole bases, made things happen on the bases. But he was not an RBI man. Right-handed swinger, the pitch to him. And he lunges at a low slider. He helped him out there. I mean, absolutely, the, the last pitch you would expect the guy trying to get an RBI would be chasing on a first pitch, but he chased that. That ball might have bounced to the catcher had he not swung at it at all. Well, the one thing that he does, though, he puts Joe Creedy in a tough situation at third base because they know he will bunt, and he's not an RBI man, so bunting to load the bases is not a bad idea if you're Tavares into the edge of the grass at third and he shows bunt he drops it third, third base side bareheaded pickup by Contreras the throw to first and he got him by a step the runners advance let's see what he did there is he didn't get it down the line if he bunched that ball down the third baseline he beats it out for a base hit but a good job by Contreras to be able to bounce off the mound get it pick it up and throw him out but if that ball's toward the line he has a base hit and that's and Creedy couldn't defend against that The official score is nonetheless going to give him credit for a sacrifice bunt. Yeah, you? I think this early in the ball game they will normally do that because he does move the tying runs in the scoring position. So I, I don't think it's that bad a play. And you've got Berkman coming up. They're right. their best hitter. Right. And a base hit now could tie the game. And then, but you've also got Ozzy Guillen out to the mound now right. with a little chat with Contreras. Well, he wants to talk to him. I mean, you pick one guy in the lineup, and we picked. I've chosen... Bergman and Innsberg, and I think that's what he's saying. We don't want this guy to beat us or even tie the game, so to speak, so we'll see how they pitch him. He was able to keep Bergman off balance with the fork ball and the changeup his first at bat. In fact, he took a third call strike, so we'll see how he approaches him in this at bat. There are no surprises this time of year, basically in a guy's strength. I mean, the White Sox didn't play Houston the last couple of years in Italy, play, but they have them extremely well scouted and they know that Ensberg has not been the same hitter since he got hit in the wrist in early September so here's the pitch to Berkman and a change up is lying down the right field line that's going to be a base hit one hop up against the wall and that will tie the game Everett is in to score Biggio around third he scores into second with a double is Berkman and this one is three to three and that's a smart hitting there by Berkman. I mean, they got him with fork balls the first time up. So, I mean, quite naturally, he sits on a fork ball, and that's what they throw him on the first pitch. And he gets a fork ball, and he hits it down the right field line. That's good hitting. But again, he's the right guy in the right situation. It wasn't a great fork ball. It was up a little bit. But by the same token, Tavares' bunt made this possible. So, although he was, in our eyes anyway, clearly bunting for a hit, 
it worked out well even as a sacrifice. So here is Ensberg now with a chance to put Houston ahead and he takes high for ball one. Two down, two in. Lance Berkman speaks loudly. A, uh, a hanging fork ball there from Jose Contreras, three think, to three. I think it was the wrong pitch, wrong time. I think you, you should have showed him a fastball at least. Now a sinker is tapped foul off to the left of the plate. One ball, one strike. Let's pause 10 seconds for station identification. This is the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. You're on Daytona's Sports Source, 1380 WELE, Ormond Beach, Florida. Yes. Berkman at second, two down. The 1-1 pitch to Ensberg, and a fastball is too low. In the Berkman situation, they had showed him, it seemed like, four straight fork balls. And that's, you know, a good hitter will adjust to that. You throw him a fastball off the plate inside or something just to show him another pitch and then go back to what you want. But they started him off with a fork ball and good hitting by Berkman. Ensberg flat out to right his first time. Right-handed hitter, opened up stance. And that fastball just misses inside, and Przinsky seemed a little upset with that call by Joe West, although Przinsky gave a target on the outside corner and then reached back across the plate to the inside corner, but nonetheless, he thought it was over that corner. Joe West did not think so. Three and one the count with another lefty who has a home run tonight, Mike Lamb on deck. There's a fastball, ground ball to short, two hops to his left. Uribe up with it. The throw to first in time, and that's the inning. But the Astros come uh, storming back with two of their own to retie the game. Iguchi, Dai, and Konerko coming up after two and a half. It is three to three. It's the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. All right, what do we have? Male patient trying to get a loan for a car. They're checking his credit now. What's the status? Looks like he's got some credit problems. I've seen this before. What's his credit score? He doesn't know, doctor. What? He, he went for a loan without knowing his credit score? We're losing the loan. All right, I'm going to call it. How's your financial health? With Score Power from Equifax, you get your credit report and credit score. It's the first step to healthy credit. Doctor, there's a woman trying to buy a house without her credit score. It's an epidemic. Get the power. Score Power at Equifax.com. A lot of special fond memories. The boys really love the tree house, and we're hoping that the new family will, too. Well, when we decided to sell our house, the first thing we did was call a realtor. It was a great relief to have someone that knew what they were doing. So when I see the realtor R, I feel confident. Selling a home takes experience, commitment, and a lot of know-how. Ask your agent if they're a realtor, a member of the National Association of Realtors. We're experts in a lot of things, but selling the house isn't one of them. A message from your local, state, and national realtor associations. Hey, boss. Yes? You know how we save so much time with each free carrier pickup we get from the U.S. Postal Service? Oh, sure. Well, I figure we can save even more time by using initials. Uh -huh. So instead of saying free carrier pickup, we just say FCP. Right. It'll save us valuable seconds each week. Initials, huh? Like a G-O-O-M-O. -O -O. Exactly, sir. What does that stand for? Get out of my office. You catch on quickly, sir. Go to USPS.com today. Print labels, pay for postage, and request a free carrier pickup. It's simple and it's free. Boys and Girls Clubs, Major League Baseball Charities, and Dontrell Willis on... Pay attention, guys, this is Keith. Now step, and then kick your leg up real high. <laughs> Who's next? Both of you guys can do it at the same time. Do you guys love? You want to use my glove? You can use mine. See, that's a great teammate right there. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> that's awesome, that's awesome. Everyone has to have mean faces. Mean faces. What's everyone smiling about? <laughs> Boys and Girls Clubs and Major League Baseball. Together, they create a positive place for kids. Roger Clemens has been taken out of this game and the word from the Houston clubhouse is that Clemens strained that left hamstring and uh, you had mentioned that you thought that that hamstring was probably giving him some trouble and that is in fact the case. Well Johnny if you watch Roger Clemens all year as I have Every once in a while, he would explode the fastball upstairs. I didn't see any of that today. And he normally can keep the splitter down and the sinker down, and he wasn't doing that consistently today. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, your leg drive. And I, I just saw him, and he just looked like he was struggling to me. So he has replaced the 43-year-old veteran 
of 341 regular season victories is replaced by a 26-year-old rookie, Wandy Rodriguez, who is from the Dominican Republic. The left-hander throws, and a fastball in there for a called strike to Iguchi, who ran up as if to bunt. And Iguchi is 0 for 1. Rodriguez is one of those finesse kind of left-handers. Good changeup. He throws. Curveball is on the fist, a pop-up towards second. One hop to Biggio, who charges it. A quick one-hop throw to first, dug out of the dirt by Lamb, just in time to retire Iguchi. And that was a very slow developing play, as they say. Biggio didn't have a chance to do anything but wait for it to come down, but it took Iguchi a long time to get to first base. And Biggio, I mean, he did charge the ball, but he didn't have time to, to catch it before it bounced. They made a quick spin pivot. And as you said uh, in one of our broadcasts during the league championship series, didn't have time to grip that grip one across it. the no. seams. Yeah, just got rid of it. Here's Jermaine Dye. He homered into the right field bullpen in the first inning for the first run of this World Series. And he takes a ball up and away, a curveball missing. Wandy Rodriguez. Ten wins, ten losses for the Astros this year. Fastball is too high, 2-0. He had a 5.53 earned run average. The man who replaced Roger Clemens had a 1.87 ERA. The 2-0 pitch, fastball bounced foul off to the right. But uh, here it is, Wandy Rodriguez, a rookie. He got his first major league loss this year as a starting pitcher right here in Chicago, but the other side of town at Wrigley Field. The Cubs beat him. An in-house monitor showing Rodgers going down the steps, and he definitely was favoring his left hamstring. There's a slider in the dirt to Jermaine Dye, and now the count is 3-1. and one. Wandy, W-A-N-D-Y. 3-1 pitch. And that's too low. So Dye... Draws a walk. His home run went out to the bullpen right near where Rodriguez was sitting and watching back in the first inning. So now he gets a chance to face him himself. And he just kind of danced around the strike zone, but not much in the strike zone. Well, that's what he does, John. He kind of pitches around the strike zone. And it's kind of interesting. We've talked so much for the last few days about the pitching and the starting pitching on both of these staffs. And we've had six runs scored in less than three innings. So... This is a different scenario than most of us thought we would be seeing, witnessing. The Astros, three runs, four hits, including a home run by Mike Lamb and a two-run double by Lance Berkman in the third that tied the game. The White Sox, three runs and four hits, including a home run by Jermaine Dye. And they had a two-run second-inning rally. Krasinski knocked in a run with an infield out, and Uribe hit a double to knock in a run. Clemens gone after two innings pitched. And here in the third with a 3-3 score, the White Sox slugging cleanup hitter Konerko stands in, and he looks at a fastball in there for a called strike from Wandy Rodriguez. One strike delivery and a curveball that he swing, a check swing by Konerko, and a peel made. To Jeff Nelson, the first base umpire, and he rules in favor of Konerko. No swing. One ball, one strike to count. That loss by Rodriguez in Chicago back in May was also his, not just his first Major League start, but it was his Major League debut, period. Here's the pitch, and a breaking ball in the dirt on the inside, knocked down by Osmus. The ball rolls off to his left a few feet, but holding it first is Die as... Osmus was able to keep that ball in front of him all the while. Two and one the count. Well, the White Sox, one thing for sure, because they haven't had a game since last Sunday, they've had a lot of time to study this, this Houston ball club. Scouting reports, they watched them on the last uh, couple of games of their series against the Cardinals. There's a strike call on the outside. Two and two the count. So there should not be a whole lot about this Astros club that would come as a big surprise. 
Just another one of those good hit and run situations if you want to take it. Yeah, they're not taking it, but the ball is lined into right center field for a base hit. In to pick it up is Jason Lane. He throws it back into second base. Dye stops at second. So Canerco shortens up in his stroke, a two-strike act. Gets himself a single. Runners at first and second with one out. And here is Carl Everett. Well, if he'd have been running, obviously, you would go to third on that play. That's why I believe in the hit and run so much because especially with a left-handed pitcher on the mound, right-handed hitters need to go to right field to stay on the ball because his fastball automatically tails away from them. But a good job of hitting anyway by Konerko. Yeah. But, I mean, you talk about the hit and run. You had a pitcher out there who's not a strikeout kind of a pitcher. Exactly. Well, that's the other point. So here's Carl Everett, a switch hitter, batting right-handed. The pitch to him. Fastball on the inside corner for a called strike. Everett singled batting left-handed, leading off the second inning against Roger Clemens, starting that two-run rally. He hit 251 this year. But had a, a higher average batting right-handed at 267 batting right-handed. And he swings at that low curveball and chops it foul back behind the plate. And quickly, he's behind in the count now, 0 and 2. You know, it's interesting, a lot of people may have forgotten that Carl Everett played for the Astros, you know, years ago, and he had a couple of good years there. And uh, no less an authority than Jeff Bagwell said he was a, an excellent teammate. Right. And they were, and Bagwell himself was very upset when they lost him. Now the fastball to the inside. That one misses off the corner, bending him back a bit. One ball and two strikes. Everett was very productive as an Astro. He played there 1998 and 99. Hit 296 one year and 325 his last year there in 99 with 108 runs battered in. A 1-2 pitch. Swing and a high fly ball foul off the left field line and well back out of play. That's the old chopping wood swing right there. That pitch was way up and it looked like he's chopping wood. Way up and way in. Yeah, he's trying to get on top of it. Carl Everett, now 34 years old. Been in the big league since 1993. Playing professionally since 1990. And a curveball in the dirt. Swung on and missed. He struck him out. And Everett swung at a lot of bad pitches in that at bat. Every one he swung at was bad. That was, you're exactly right. But most of them were inside, and that's why. Curveball inside, fastball inside. He was swinging. So Wandy Rodriguez, and he's a guy that will exploit a free swinger. Right. He does not want to throw strikes. You have to force him to throw strikes. Dye still at second. Conurco still at first. Everett retired. And here is Aaron Rowan. Rowan looks at a curveball in there for a strike. Rowan got that big hit in the second inning. After the leadoff single by Everett, they put the hit and run play on. And sure enough, he bounced one on the right side of the infield. Just a, a routine-looking bouncer, but it was right in the spot where nobody could get to it. Now the pitch, a fastball rolled to third, right to Ensberg. He flips the ball to Biggio at second with a force out of Conurco. And the threat has come and gone for the White Sox against young Wandy Rodriguez. So we're heading to the fourth inning. Lamb, Bagwell, and Lane coming up. Houston three, the White Sox three. It's the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. Tire City, Volusia County's largest tire warehouse, has the names you know and trust. Pirelli's Goodyear, Michelin, BF Goodrich, Cooper, and more, with discounted prices on new and used tires. Tire City, family-owned for 15 years, has brake specials, mufflers, and CV axles. Fuel injector service, $59.99 for most cars. Buy four new or used tires and get a free oil change. That's Tire City, muffler and repair shop, 1178 South Nova Road, Ormond Beach, 677-0160. Tire installation while you wait, open six days a week at Tire City. 
The Daytona Dogs, serving Chicago-style hot dogs and more. Try these taste-tempting Vienna hot dogs, jumbo dogs, Italian beef or sausage, Polish sausage, and steak burgers are some of the many dogs Daytona Dogs serves. Next time you're in a mood for the taste that made Chicago famous, stop on into Daytona Dogs. Proud supporters of the Chicago White Sox. Go Sox! Located on West International Speedway Boulevard, Daytona Beach, half mile past the racetrack. Call today for takeout at 258-9200, 258-9200. Are you hot under the collar? Well, keep your cool with Tropical Auto Air with two convenient locations to serve you better. 1092 South Ridgewood Avenue, Edgewater, and 700 South Nova Road, Daytona. Tropical Auto Air offers a free 20-point service check, including belts, hoses, fluids, and more. We also offer a free air conditioning and heating check and a free brake inspection. Radiator flush on most cars starting at just $34.95. Tune-ups and radiator flush just $54.95 for most cars. CV axles at just $89.95 for most cars. Timing belt specials only $99.95 for most cars. And if your engine light is on and you have engine trouble, Tropical Auto Air offers a free diagnostic check. We have complete auto repair with fully ASE certified factory trained mechanics on both foreign and domestic. Also, factory trained import specialists for Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. For all your auto repair needs, it's Tropical Auto Air. 1092 South Ridgewood Avenue, Edgewater, 428-3787 and 700 South Nova Road, Daytona, 226-2070. 2005 World Series from Chicago. On ESPN Radio, I'm John Miller, along with Joe Morgan. And we've got a 3-3 tie as we head to the fourth inning. Mike Lamb, who hit a home run his first time, a left-handed hitter, stands in against the right-hander, Contreras. And Contreras throws him a high fastball in there for a called strike. John, what I see from Contreras also, he doesn't have as sharp a control as he would like. But again, this is his first, you know, World Series start. He delivers. And a swing and a miss, strike two. Actually, those are the two best fastballs he's thrown. I think he's a lot better personally when he throws three quarters. He drops down on every right-handed hitter, and I don't think he's as effective. There's a pop-up foul. Just back off to our left and back out of play. That was right toward Jaime Harin, the Hall of Fame uh, broadcaster in Spanish for the Los Angeles Dodgers and also in this World Series for ESPN Radio's Spanish broadcast. There's a ball up and away. One ball, two strikes to Lamb. Jeff Bagwell on deck. Three to three. Tomorrow night, game two. A couple of left-handers, Mark Burley for the White Sox, and Andy Pettit will go for Houston. Now the pitch. There's a fork ball. Swung out and missed. He struck him out. That one ended up in the dirt. Przinsky tags out Lamb for the put out. And see, that's what happens to me when he gets up on top. His fork ball is more effective. But when he drops down, it's okay to drop down to get ahead of the right-hand hitters, but I think to finish them off, he needs to get back on top a little bit. But I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he uh, wants to make sure that he doesn't make a mistake with the right-handers and he gets the ball away from him. One out, here's Jeff Bagwell. He swings and misses at a low fastball. And it is 0-1. 3-3 to the score in the top of the fourth inning. Three runs, five hits for the White Sox. Three runs, four hits for the Astros. Bagwell was hit by a pitch his first time. Here it comes. Bagwell takes up and away for a ball. And Jeff Bagwell really universally liked around baseball. And he'd been a leader in that Astros clubhouse almost since he first got there. But he's one of the truly nice guys in the game, John, and he went out every day to play hard. I think that's why everyone's so happy for him being in this World Series. Here's the one-on-one -on -one pitch. And that is a ball down and away. Two and one the count. And I'm sorry to cut you off, John, but I was trying to say that he's now throwing up on top to the right-hander. And I think I like that because he's got such good stuff. You know, use your good stuff. I mean, he's trying to trick him by dropping down a lot. You know, if you show a guy three straight pitches down there, then you lose the effectiveness of, of the of the sidearm. 2-1 pitch. And that is inside with a fastball. 3-1. Jeff Bagwell is a... He's a leader more by example. He's not a... Right. A rah-rah a kind of a guy. 
three one pitch bounced foul softly off to the left of the plate three and two but before they took the field against their game with the Cardinals earlier this week for game six after that amazing loss in game five that looked like it was one and then they lost it before they went out of the field Bagwell spoke to his teammates and basically said there's one team that can go out and go to the World Series with a win tonight and go out there get a couple runs early and let's let's go to the series Bagwell swings a high drive out toward left center medium deep near the warning track is Pesetic and he makes the catch and that is out number two but I think you know it was it was a a club leader normally very soft-spoken and uh, it was a very short little speech words of inspiration but it carried a lot of weight because he's not a guy who makes speeches in the clubhouse. And I'm, I, I'm, I really, I'm close to Jeff, and I know him very well. And that took a lot of him for him to say something, and especially since he wasn't starting. You know, it's, it's easy for guys to say, rah, rah, let's go, when you're not out there. But they know Jeff means it, and Jeff is, you know, so sincere. You know, I think one of the greatest things I ever heard about Frank Robinson was he didn't say rah, rah, when somebody else was going to the plate, let's go. He said, let's go when he was walking to the plate. And that's the big difference. Ball one now to Jason Lane, right-handed hitter. Now he swings and pops it up foul, first base side. Konerko hustles over to the Houston dugout, but that ball is just back and into the dugout where he cannot reach it, and the count is one and one to Lane. Well, Bagwell pointed that out in his speech. He said, you know, we've all been working so hard for so many years to get to this World Series, and I'm, I can't do anything about it at all. I'm not in position to help you. In any way, you guys can go out, though, and just keep in mind, we're the one team that can get to a World Series with a win tonight. Now the pitch is swinging a high fly ball to right field. Over to his left goes Dye. Plenty of room. He's under it. He's got it. And that's the inning. That's the best inning for Contreras since the first inning. Three up, three down. Krasinski, Creedy, Uribe coming up. We go to the last of the fourth. It is three to three. It's the World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. Hey, it's me, Regis Philbin. Know what's great about hosting a national talk show? You hear the latest health and nutrition information. That's why I was surprised to find out that a great thing you can do to help promote a healthy heart comes from something I've loved my whole life. Welch's 100% grape juice. Yeah, the same delicious grape juice we all grew up on. is actually good for your heart because Welch's is made from antioxidant-rich Concord grapes with no added sugar. It's even certified by the American Heart Association. Welch's 100% grape juice, the most delicious thing you can do for your heart. It's a line drive for the Xerox Work Center multifunction system. It scans at the first, prints the second, copies the third, the relay over the network, in color! Oh, what a play! I'll tell you, Jim, this Xerox Work Center C2424 does it all! Oh, yeah, it's got good speed, too. 24 color pages a minute, yet costs less than $3,000. That's impressive. Yeah. Well, here we go again. The wind-up. The pitch. It's popped up, but Xerox Work Center is right there to take care of business. What an all-star! Hey, to learn more, visit Xerox.com slash office. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> For all the best in wireless, it's Radio Shack. Come see for yourself now during our best of the best wireless sale. With a hot new Sprint PCS phone 8300 by Sanyo, you can get serious music on Sprint featuring 20 great commercial-free music channels of Sirius Satellite Radio. Get this phone for just $99.99 with qualifying new two-year Sprint subscriber agreement at Radio Shack. Go to 11505 after $30 Radio Shack and Surrey Bank. Offer not available in all markets. Restrictions early termination activation fees apply. Add serious music service phone $6.95 per month. Details in store. Hey, boss. Yes? You know how we save so much time with each free carrier pickup we get from the U.S. Postal Service? Oh, sure. Well, I figure we can save even more time by using initials. Uh -huh. So instead of saying free carrier pickup, we just say FCP. Right. It'll save us valuable seconds each week. Initials, huh? Like a G-O-O-M-O. -O -O. Exactly, sir. What does that stand for? Get out of my office. You catch on quickly, sir. Go to USPS.com today. Print labels, pay for postage, and request a free carrier pickup. It's simple and it's free. The 101st World Series, Game 1 coming to you from Chicago. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan on ESPN Radio. 3-3 three to three the score going to the last of the fourth. Remember the White Sox come into this World Series not having played a game since last Monday and they're 
slugging first baseman Paul Canerco talked about how they were going to try and overcome the lack of being able to play the last several days. We had a little experience the last series. We came out a little flat in game one of the ALCS, and that should give us a little bit of an idea of what the feeling is going to be like tomorrow night um, as far as what we should expect from, you know, just your body and, you know, what, what the energy is going to be like. So we need to, you know, kick it in gear and make an extra effort, I think. All right, so uh, th that experience of the of a long layoff before the league championship series maybe uh, helps them here. This, the first pitch from Wandy Rodriguez to A.J. Pruszynski is a curve in the dirt for ball one. Lefty versus lefty, and a fastball in at the knees for a strike. And they, when he talked about flat, Joe, I mean, it was really like they made mistakes. They were, they were, they were doing things that they ordinarily wouldn't do. Now, bunning them properly, a lot of things were out of line and they were out of sync. There's a curveball grounded up the first baseline, deep to field it is Lamb. He dishes off to Rodriguez over the cover, in time with a foot out at first base. Brzezinski is out number one. But the one thing that Oz again told us today also, John, was that, you know, his relief pitches threw really well in simulated games, and so he said he's not concerned about them being able to pitch even after the long layoff. He said they threw the ball really well. But that's an assimilated game. You can only tell once they get out here in a real game with the adrenaline of a World Series flowing through their arms. Through their bodies, I should say. Well, the arms are part of the body. Yeah, but hey, it's not going to be just the arm. <laughs> There's a swing and a miss by Joe Creedy on the first pitch here from Wandy Rodriguez. Creedy grinded out to third his first time. Now a fastball right on the outside corner at the knees. Strike two call. Three to three, the score here in the last of the fourth inning. White Sox had a threat against Rodriguez. Two on and one out in the third inning. As he may have had a lot of adrenaline pumping through his system. Greedy swings. There's a long high drive. Deep left center. Way back there. This ball is a home run. The center fielder, Tavares, leaped up, got his glove above the wall, but the ball was beyond him. And Joe Creedy with a home run to left center, setting off the fireworks. It is four to three. The White Sox have gone back ahead. And so much for a waste 0-2 pitch. That was an 0-2 pitch, and he got a lot of the plate. It was up, but it was in the wrong spot. Good job of hitting by Creedy. Tavares made a great effort to catch it, vaulting himself above the, the wall out there and getting his glove up beyond the wall, but still could not come up with it. Here is Uribe, and he takes a breaking ball too low. Well, watching on the in-house monitor, I mean, the fastball was made probably out of the strike zone, but it was an 0-2 pitch, and Freddy hammered it. The fastball right over the plate, but as you say, it was up. And I might have, looking at the monitor, Tavares might have tipped that ball. There's a slider bounced foul back behind the plate by Uribe. But w watching Tavares, I mean, he timed his leap perfectly. No, he couldn't get there, but I mean, it was a just perfect leap timing. Here's the one-two pitch, and that's a fastball too long. It turned out that for Tavares, it just wasn't possible right. for there to be a catch in that play, but... If, the, if it had been possible, he would have caught it. Because he, he, he was perfect. There's a ball in the dirt on the inside to Uribe. Three and two. Uribe ripped a double into the gap in left center to knock in a run with two down in the second inning. One of those coveted two-out RBI hits. Four to three, the White Sox lead fourth inning. Wandy Rodriguez, the left-hander, throws low and outside, and he walked him. This game took a turn, and we're not sure exactly when the turn occurred, but Roger Clemens strained his left hamstring. He ended up battling through it for a couple of innings, but they were tortured innings. He gave up three runs and four hits, and they finally took him out of the game after a couple of innings. And here's the pitching coach, Jim Hickey, out to the mound now to talk to Wande Rodriguez. You see that? It seems like you see it a lot anyway with young pitchers especially, but sometimes even veterans, when they give up a home run, the next guy's going to get a walk. Yeah, they're, they're, the young pitchers especially, they're not going to give up two straight home runs. At least that's their, their goal. 
Clemens, the great, the rocket, with his first game one start of his illustrious career in a World Series. But he had to leave after two innings. And now the young rookie, Wandy Rodriguez, is in there instead. And he has fallen behind on the home run by Creedy here in the fourth. One out, Uribe at first. Pesedic, the leadoff man in, is at the plate now. A left-handed hitter against a left-handed thrower. And there's a pickoff throw to first. Back to the bag is Uribe. Uribe only had four steals this year. Now Rodriguez to the plate. Pesedic takes inside for ball one. The third baseman, Ensberg, plays him shallow in on the grass. A lot of offense early in this first game of the World Series and I think it was kind of touted as a pitching matchup we were thinking maybe two to one or three to two there have been three home runs hit already there is a called strike and the count is one and one to, to Pesetti Pesetti has not been a base yet he's grounded out to short and struck out Scott Pesetti from a Milwaukee Brewer they traded high to get him. That was sort of the signature trade of their offseason. Of the, the new look White Sox for this year. Now the pitch. Curveball low and outside. And it is two and one. Pesednik really did exactly what they hoped he would do when they got him. He got on base, made things happen at the top of the order. And then he started doing it again. Oh, he, the, the last half of the season after he came back from injury, he wasn't doing it much. But the thing that he did, John, even more than what they asked of him, he set an example for the other guys how to run the bases, how to be aggressive, and what to do. And I think that helped him just as much as the numbers that he put up. Now the stretch. Rodriguez, another pickoff throw to first, diving back this time. Uribe. So what do you think, based well, on Uribe's dive back to the bag there, Joe? Well, they thought that he was going... And he almost balked because once your foot goes behind the runner, your right foot, if you're a left-handed pitcher, you have to go to the plate. And he was very close. And he does go to the plate. There's a ground ball toward the middle and through. Base hit into center field. Uribe to second base. He'll stop there as Tavares charges the ball into shallow center and throws it into the shortstop, Adam Everett. So Uribe to second. Pasede with his first base hit of this World Series. And here comes Iguchi with the power hitters right behind him. And I think that was one of those situations, John, where they were lucky they weren't hitting and running on that play. Because the ball was up the middle and the shortstop would have been covering. I think he would have been able to get to the ball. So now Tada Iguchi. And Iguchi, who because of Pesednik, altered his game considerably. As the number two hitter in Japan, he was a third place hitter. Right handed batter, the pitch swing and a ground ball pulled just foul past third. And on down the left field line. And, and I've watched him, he seems to be a lot more comfortable hitting against left handed pitching, John, than he does right handed pitching. Uh, uh, he, he just seems to wait a little better and, and, and react better. But you're right, he sacrificed a lot hitting second because he had to bunt a lot, take pitches, etc., hitting behind Posetnik. One strike delivery. As a ground ball to second, should be two. Biggio to second and one. Everett to first. Two. A double play. And the inning is over. And the inning ends with Jermaine Dye on deck. So a big play there to get the rookie out of trouble. Heading to the fifth inning now. It is four to three. Chicago back ahead. The World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. Continues after these messages from your local station. Are you hot under the collar? Well, keep your cool with Tropical Auto Air with two convenient locations to serve you better. 1092 South Ridgewood Avenue, Edgewater, and 700 South Nova Road, Daytona. Tropical Auto Air offers a free 20-point service check, including belts, hoses, fluids, and more. We also offer a free air conditioning and heating check and a free brake inspection. Radiator flush on most cars starting at just $34.95. Tune-ups and radiator flush just $54.95 for most cars. CV axles at just $89. 
$99.95 for most cars. Timing belt specials only $99.95 for most cars. And if your engine light is on and you have engine trouble, Tropical Auto Air offers a free diagnostic check. We have complete auto repair with fully ASC certified factory trained mechanics on both foreign and domestic. Also, factory trained import specialists for Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. For all your auto repair needs, it's Tropical Auto Air. 1092 South Ridgewood Avenue, Edgewater, 428-3787, and 700 South Nova Road, Daytona, 226-2070. Southside Collision, located at 206 North Young Street, US 1 Ormond Beach, is your one stop for expert auto body repair and color matching. At Southside Collision, we have personal service with pride and quality in our work. And remember, we beat higher dealer costs with quick turnarounds to get you back on the road faster. Ask about our senior discounts. That's Southside Collision, 206 North Young Street, US 1 Ormond Beach. Call 615-6266. If you like Italian food as much as I do, then let me tell you about the two best places to get it. Genovese's, 116 Dunlawton Avenue in the Shores, 767-4151, or Genovese's at 183 East Granada Boulevard, Ormond Beach, 677-3222, proudly serving you since 1981 with the best pizza, pasta, and salads anywhere. No pre-made frozen crusts or conveyor ovens here. Uh-uh, Genovese's makes everything fresh from scratch, the way it should be made, and delivers it hot and fresh right to you. And take my word for it. At Genovese's has the most authentic New York pizza south of the city. And there's spaghetti or ziti with marinara sauce and meatballs or sausage. Fettuccine Alfredo, chicken or eggplant parmesan are true Italian delicacies. That's Genovese's Italian Cafe, 116 Dunlawton Avenue in the Shores, 767-4151 or 183 East Granada Boulevard, 677-3222. Eat in, take out, or we deliver. Genovese's, limited delivery area on home runs. They scored the other two runs by manufacturing a run. A hit and run that put runners at first and third, and then they were able to score both of those guys. But the other two runs came on solo homers, which is what they do a lot of also. That, you know, they just have a couple of ways of getting runs. Here's Adam Everett and a sidearm fastball in there for a called strike. Everett hit into a force play his first time. Everett grew up outside of Atlanta. He was a great Braves fan. Here's the pitch now. Swing a ground ball, third base side. Backhanded just in front of the bag by Creedy. Fair ball. His throw to first in time to get Everett. That's only a fair ball of it because he was in front of the bag. It's about to go foul. So, two men gone, and here is Craig Biggio. They played umpire West and the third base umpire Cousins. Cousins immediately made the call. Usually it's supposed to be the home plate umpire's call until it passes the bag. They were both, after the play, looking at each other, both nodding their heads. Two down, here's Biggio. And a fastball. Uh, I kept waiting for West to call that one a strike, but he never did. Called the ball off the outside, apparently. Biggio has grounded out to third and singled. Scored a run. The pitch, that is a slider low and outside. Two and up. I just still wonder why, with such good stuff that Contreras continues every time a right-hander comes up, he just drops down. 2-0 and o pitch. Drops down with a fastball for a strike. 2-1. and one. But when they got him, Ozzie Guillen said that he was throwing everything straight over the top, mm -hmm. which was unlike the way he had pitched in Cuba. Right. And Ozzie finally said that he had all kinds of troubles here, too, as he had had with the Yankees when they first got him. Swing and a ground ball towards short. Over from third goes Preeti. He's got it. Throws him out at first, and the inning is over. A seven-pitch inning for Contreras. His easiest inning yet. He's retired seven in a row. The big guns are coming up with the White Sox. Die, Canerco, and Everett. Four to three, Chicago. This is the World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. Whether you're big or tall, or both, you know how hard it is to find clothes that fit you right. Unless you go to JCPenney, where you'll find a tremendous selection of big and tall clothes. From brands like Dockers, St. John's Bay, Van Heusen, and Arizona, made to fit you. Big and tall shops are in most larger JCPenney stores. And you can find a store near you at jcpenney.com. You can also shop online or by catalog. So save big and tall. It's all inside JCPenney. 
I'm Keith Jackson with the Rose Bowl Classic Moment. Brought to you by City. Credit cards and financial tools to help you live richly. The first bowl game ever to match the AP's number one in two teams, the 1963 Rose Bowl. Top-ranked USC met Wisconsin in a passing battle that saw Pete Bethard throw four touchdown passes for the Trojans, while Ron Vandekellen threw two for the Badgers. Bethard's heroics led USC to a 42-37 win, the second-highest scoring Rose Bowl game ever. The following is an OnStar conversation. OnStar emergency, this is Natalie. Yes, I need an ambulance. I have my two children in the car and my sister. Okay, I have you on Highway 20. Yes, that is correct. Okay, I'm contacting emergency services. Thank you. Every month, OnStar offers help in thousands of emergencies. Hi, this is Natalie with OnStar. Calling to report a vehicle crash with airbag deployment. What happened? I can conference them in. Ma'am, tell me what's going on. My nephew has a big gas. His head is bleeding. Okay, we'll send someone out. Do you want me to remain on the line? Yes, ma'am, please. The peace of mind OnStar offers is more affordable than you might think. Okay, the police are there. Yes, thank you. The first year of OnStar service is included on new OnStar equipped GM vehicles and unlimited use of all safety and security services costs only $16.95 plus tax per month after that. OnStar by GM. To experience OnStar, press your blue button or visit OnStar.com. Now the White Sox into the last half of the fifth inning. Game one of the 2005 World Series. On ESPN Radio, I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. And we'll be right back here tomorrow night, game two, Mark Burley. The left-hander for the White Sox, a 16-game winner in the regular season. And he'll be up against Andy Pettit, the left-hander for the Astros, a 17-game winner. And then this series will move on to Houston. Game three will be Tuesday night for Minute Maid Park. And another excellent matchup there, Roy Oswalt, the 20-game winner. And the... MVP of the league championship series for the Astros. And he'll be up against an 18-game winner, John Garland, on Tuesday. There is ball one to Jermaine Dye. Wandy Rodriguez in relief of Roger Clemens, who left after two innings with a strained left hamstring. Rodriguez facing Dye, Canerco, and Everett. The big hitters are up. The pitch. Fastball tails away outside. Ball two. Dye has homered to right field and walked. Be followed by Canerco, the cleanup hitter, and then Everett. 2 0 pitch. Fastball outside, ball three. Three and 0 pitch, way outside. He walks him on four pitches, and he has now walked a hitter in each of the innings that he has been in. Three walks in two plus innings now so here's Konerko who has grounded out to short and single well the one thing with Rodriguez is that he has to be fine I mean his his, his margin for error is very slim so he tries to hit the corners and that's why when he misses he does fall and get in trouble White Sox lead four to three and a curveball in there for a called strike to Konerko. If he can't throw his curveball over and his changeup over, then he's in trouble because he doesn't have a good enough fastball that he can throw it when the hitter's looking for it. The Astros' bullpen looks like it's going to get busy. Here's the pitch now, and a curve low and inside for a ball. A ball and a strike to Konerko. Springer has gotten up out there, but he is he's not throwing right at the moment. Here's the pitch. Low and outside with a fastball. Two and one as he pitches oh so carefully to these White Sox sluggers. And he, but he has to, John, and, and, and I, I understand his, what he's doing. He was trying to get Pernerko to chase that little sinker there to get him the ground ball and maybe get out of trouble here by getting a double play. Canerco, who was voted the MVP of the league championship series. Here's the throw to first and back to the bag. Here's Jermaine Dye. Dye, you got to keep an eye on him. I mean, he's a veteran. He's been around for a long time. Not as fast as he once was. But he did have 11 steals this year. Springer, the right-hander, 
is throwing now in the bullpen for the Astros. Here's the pitch. Way outside with a fastball. Tailing away from Conurco. And it is now three and one. And this is obviously a good hit and run situation, but it's tough sometimes for the hitter. If it's a ball, you just go ahead and take it. But a lot of times if you're thinking hit and run, you will swing at a pitch out of the strike zone. You have to maintain your discipline even if they send die. Only swing if it's in the strike zone. Right. I don't think they're going to send him, to be honest with you. I think they would wait till three and two. He's not running. 3-1 pitch. Lined into center field. That's going to be a base hit. One hop to Tavares. Die over to second. He'll stop there. So Konerko, ahead of the count. It's a solid single to center. And you have to appreciate Konerko's approach. That was not a, a fat pitch to swing at, but he didn't. He didn't try to launch it. Right, exactly. And and but I think you have to give Jermaine Dye a little credit too, because both times he's been on base and they didn't want to walk Conerco, you know, to put a runner in scoring position. So he made him swing the bat and Conerco did a good job of taking, as they say, what he could get out of that, a fastball away, just went right back through the middle with it. The White Sox have had eight hits in this game. Plus, they've received three walks, so they put 11 men on base in four-plus innings. Nobody out here in the fifth. They lead the game four to three. Jim Hickey, the pitching coach, out to the mound, talking with Juan D. Rodriguez. And Jim West, the plate umpire, goes out, asks him to uh, move it along as Russ Springer, the right-hander, continues to heat up in the bullpen. You've got the switch-hitting Everett coming up now. And a right-handed hitter, Rowan, behind him. And then a lefty. Brzezinski after him, or Brzezinski after him. Now, Everett is not a guy you think of in terms of the sacrifice bunt. And in fact, he did not have any sacrifice bunts this year. No, I don't think this is a situation where they would, but he he's knows. A, he's an RBI man. And he is bunting. He bunts it, third base side, and that's going to work. Ensberg over to first for the out. The runners have been moved up. Die over to third, Konerko over to second. The first time all year that Carl Everett got down a sacrifice bunt. Well, and, and you know, you have to wonder whether he did that on his own or whether it was called for by Ozzie Gian. We'll have to ask him tomorrow, especially since he didn't have any sacrifices during the year. But I, I, I like the play because the last time up, he did not ha not have good swings at Hernandez. So here Rodriguez, is sorry. here is Rowan. He has singled and hit into a force play. The pitch. High curveball. One ball and no strikes. Everett. The last time he had a sacrifice bunt, he was playing for the Texas Rangers in 2003. They're going to go ahead and walk Everett now with the left-handed hitting Krasinski coming up next. Makes a lot of sense because, as you mentioned earlier, Krasinski hits into a lot of double plays, and you give yourself a chance to get out of this inning without any run scored if you can get the ground ball. And there's ball three outside. Four to three, the White Sox lead. Last of the fifth inning, and they've got a chance here to break this open a bit. And here comes the fourth wide one. So that will load the bases with one out, and Pruszynski is coming up. Well, he got a ground ball out of Pruszynski's last at bat with two curve balls. Pruszynski is ordinarily not a real patient hitter. He rarely walks. As he heads to the place, or his head to the plate, the, the fans rise to their feet, urging him on. They know this is the spot where the White Sox could get real comfortable in this game. Houston will play the infield double play depth. The White Sox have only had one hit out of six at-bats with runners in scoring position tonight. Here's the pitch. Fastball inside. One ball, no strikes. Krasinski has grounded into a, a force play on which he got an RBI in the second inning. Grounded out to the first baseman against Rodriguez in the fourth inning. And if you're Rowan, you got to get a big lead at first and try to break up the double play. There's another fastball inside. 2-0 to Brzezinski. Brzezinski is 
Not a patient hitter. He had only 23 walks this year. He had 460 official at bats. But he's gotten the count into his favor here. 2-0. Oh. Bases loaded. The pitch. Swing and there's a shot foul. I mean, I mean, it was very much foul. <laughs> but he got a great swing at it. And the ball leaped off his bat but then went about eight miles foul. That's what you call sitting dead red and you get the fastball and you pull it behind you almost. <laughs> That, was, that ball is about 180 feet foul. Yeah. <laughs> Doing one the count to Brzezinski. Three men on, one man out. Here it comes. Curveball, a fly ball down the left field line. Slicing toward the corner, and that ball is back out of play. A foul ball, and now it is two and two. A curveball out over the plate, you can get in the air a lot easier than the curveball on the inside part of the plate. Because you have a tendency to come up on top of the one inside, the one away you get better extension on, and you're more likely to hit a fly ball. Brzezinski. With the bases loaded, one out. And now Wendy Rodriguez steps off the slab, and Brzezinski backs out of the box. Died the runner at third. Konerko at second, Rowan at first. Four to three, the White Sox lead. Creedy pulled in, even with the bag at third. The other infielders are backed up. The middle infielders double play that. Two-two pitch, curveball, grounded first base side, fielded there by Lamb. The second one, the relay back to first with Rodriguez covering double play, and the side is retired. A first base to shortstop to pitcher double play. And nicely started by Mike Lamb. And Rowan tried to wreak mayhem on the shortstop Adam Everett at second base. But Everett got rid of that ball in time to avoid the, the contact. The White Sox do not score. The big hitters coming up. Tavares, then Berkman and Ensberg. We go to the sixth. Four to three White Sox. It's game one of the World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. Three reasons for remodeling right now. Number three, the smile I get from brushing my teeth in a new bathroom. Number two, all my recipes taste better in a brand new kitchen. And number one, get it sooner, pay for it later. Right now at the Home Depot, get special deferred financing throughout the store. And 10% off your first purchase when you open a new account. Only through October 23rd. Only at the Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. Offer valid in U.S. only. See store for details. I'm worried that there are things that are going to burn me. I had to constantly be meeting people. Open house, that's somebody else's job. I figured I could sell it on my own to save a little bit of money. I don't even know enough to know that I don't know. The first thing we did was call a realtor. As soon as I saw that realtor R, he put me right at ease. If you're thinking about selling your home, you need some help. Ask your agent if they're a realtor, a member of the National Association of Realtors. For sale by owner, but not by this owner. A message from your local, state, and national realtor associations. Cooling system failure is the number one cause of engine-related breakdowns. So get to AutoZone and pick up some antifreeze today. If you don't flush and fill your car's cooling system every other year, that old, weak antifreeze won't give your engine the protection it needs. And that could lead to some costly repairs down the road. It's fall car care season, so get to AutoZone, pick up some antifreeze, and make sure your engine is ready for the road ahead. All right, what do we have? Male patient trying to get a loan for a car. They're checking his credit now. What's the status? Looks like he's got some credit problems. I've seen this before. What's his credit score? He doesn't know, doctor. Well, he, he went for a loan without knowing his credit score? We're losing the loan! All right, I'm going to call it. How's your financial health? With Score Power from Equifax, you get your credit report and credit score. It's the first step to healthy credit. Doctor, there's a woman trying to buy a house without her credit score. It's an epidemic. Get the power. Score Power at Equifax.com. Here's Joe or really, We go to the sixth inning now And here is Willie Tavares leading it off And he belts one left center field against Tav Contreras That's into the alleyway That's a base hit It rolls to the wall The fleet footed Tavares into second Turns the corner And he'll stop there As the ball is relayed quickly Into the shortstop Uribe And uh, man things are turning around in a hurry here the, the, We just went from the White Sox With the bases loaded And one out And a chance to break it open Instead, an inning-ending double play, and now on the next pitch, a double by Willie Tavares in front of the big hitters. Berkman, Ensberg, and Lamb coming up. 
the Astros a moment ago were on the verge of being down six to three, seven to three. Who, who knows what? And now they're still down by a run, and now they're just a base hit away from tying the game. Well, you have to give Rodriguez a lot of credit. He got the curveball to Brzezinski, got the ground ball that he needed, and got out of the inning. And here now is Berkman. He drove in a two runs with a double down the right field line in the third inning and a hanging fourth ball from Contreras. Contreras, the right-hander to Berkman, batting left-handed, and a fastball just misses on the inside, apparently. Ball one. Time for Joe Morgan to answer the question of the game brought to you by Equifax. Get your credit score and credit report now. Visit Equifax.com or call 1-800-4-Equifax. The question comes from Gary Sorge of Temple, Texas. Here's the 1-0 pitch. Fastball grounded up the first base side. Knocked down by Canerco. He takes it back up. Runs it to the bag for the put out. But a productive out there for Berkman. He gets Tavares over to third base with one out. Joe, here's the question. He wants to know, is, is there less strategy used by managers when a DH is used? And if so, is that a disadvantage for the National League manager who is used to making all of those adjustments and playing the chess game and double switches and whatnot uh, when he no longer has to think about that at all? Well, I, I definitely think that, you know, with the DH, there's less strategy involved. So the National League managers may be at a disadvantage in the American League parks, but when you go to the National League, then the American League teams are at a disadvantage because they don't get to use the DH. So I think it is in the American League's favor because they've had the home field advantage in the last two World Series. Infield comes in, 4-3, to three, the White Sox lead, and there's a fastball inside the Morgan Ensberg. Ensberg, the home run and RBI leader for the Astros this year. Tonight he has flied out to right and grounded out to short. But I, I think everything evens out because one's at a disadvantage in the National League parks, one's at a disadvantage in the American League parks. Four to three, Chicago. Runner at third. Here's the pitch. Swing ground ball to third. Diving to his right. The backhanded is pretty. Gets up and throws him out at first. Tavares having to hold at third. Well, we've seen Creedy do this a lot lately. I mean, cover up down the line. That ball was drilled by Ensberg. And just a nice play by Creedy. He didn't even have time to step over. He just made a dive. Came up with it. And, of course, Tavares being close to the bag, he got back. And then he threw him out at first, threw Ensberg out at first base. So two men are gone. The infield drops back to normal depth, and here is Mike Lamb. He has homered the setter and struck out. Left-handed hitter takes a fastball from Contreras, low and inside. The ball one. Uh, a check swing by Lamb, and the White Sox appeal. So uh, thanks to Gary Sorge of Temple, Texas, he has won an ESPN Radio gift back. To ask your Equifax question of the game, log on to ESPNRadio.com. Runner at third, two down. Here's the pitch. And a changeup. Swung on and missed. Strike one. They must have great motion with the changeup. The key to the changeup is arm speed. And he must have great arm speed on that because he, Lamb was a foot and a half in front of that pitch. Jeff Bagwell would be next. The Houston bullpen is busy. Contreras throws. And a fork ball in the dirt on the inside. Knocked down nicely by Przinsky, who's got to handle every ball in the dirt here, or it could cost him a run. And you got to have a lot of confidence in your catcher that he is going to block it to throw that pitch because you do not want to fool around with Lamb. He hit a home run his first time up. You want to make sure when you throw the fork ball, you get it down. And any time you get it down, obviously, there's a chance it might bounce in the dirt. So they have to, the catcher and the pitcher really have to work together here. Two and one the count. Here it comes. And a fork ball. A one-hopper hit sharply the second. Higuchi's got it, and he throws him out at first. The inning is over. A leadoff double. And then a runner at third with one out, but the Astros come up empty with all of their big hitters. So we head to the last of the sixth. Creedy coming up. It is four to three. Chicago. It's game one of the World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service.
Mr. Shatner, you claim Priceline saves you up to $100 a night off other leading sites. Ah, uh, yes, I do. Causing irreparable damage to my clients. The other sites? How can you make such allegations? When you name your own price, Priceline finds the hotel for you in your exact neighborhood and star level. The hotels then give us huge discounts, which we pass on to you. Uh, Your Honor, I seek a five-minute recess. To book a hotel, right? Priceline. Save like nowhere else. Exact hotel shown only after purchase. To achieve true enlightenment, you must let go of all your earthly desires. That's a problem. Subway Restaurants has this new fresh toasted chicken parmesan sandwich. I can't give it up. Take a bite. Mmm. There's that old adage about food and enlightenment. What is it? A sandwich is like a real, real homemade. That's deep. Yes. Everyone wants a new fresh toasted chicken parmesan sandwich from Subway Restaurants. Tender chicken, melted cheese, zesty marinara sauce, and freshly baked bread. Subway. Eat fresh. Subway is a registered trademark of Doctors Associates, Inc. Ever wonder who coined the phrase, we eliminate the middleman. Well, one thing's pretty certain. It wasn't the middleman. And how did they eliminate him? Something fishy there. But I digress. Geico pioneered direct-to-consumer car insurance over 65 years ago, and they've been saving smart drivers money ever since. Give them a call, and you might ask them, what did they do with the middleman? Geico's customer satisfaction stands at 97%. How would you rate your car insurance company? Geico. 1-800-947-AUTO. 15 minutes could save you 15%. Back with you at U.S. Cellular Field in Chicago. The White Sox over the Astros 4-3 through 5.5. Let's bring Dave Campbell in on the conversation. Soup, everybody spent so much time talking and thinking about Roger Clemens. Unfortunately for him, he just couldn't go further than two innings tonight. Danny, he hasn't been the same since September 3rd when he pulled that hamstring. 54 pitches tonight, only three swings and misses. It was very evident in the Jermaine Diet bat. He didn't have enough to overpower these uh, White Sox hitters. Another conversation we and a lot of people had. Two great pitching staffs, a lot of offense here tonight. Yeah, and one one thing we may overlook is two great ballparks to hit in. This ballpark, 272 home runs a year ago, 39 more than any park in the major leagues, and we've seen three tonight. 4-3, the White Sox lead as they get set to hit in the bottom of the six. Now back to John and Joe. Thanks, guys. And uh, here we go now. The White Sox coming up last of the six with Joe Creedy. I mean, Creedy has blossomed into an outstanding player in this postseason. Wandy Rodriguez delivers and he misses ball one too low. Creedy, who had big hits, not just hits and RBIs, but big RBIs in the league championship series. Now he swings, lunging at a changeup, popping it foul off to the right of the plate. That will go back in amongst the spectators out of play. And it is a ball and a strike to Joe Creedy. And John, it's interesting that Phil Garner chooses to leave Wandy Rodriguez in there even though it's still a one-run ball game, and you got a lot of right-handed hitters in this lineup. Creedy, then Uribe, both right-handed, coming up here. There's a shot. It's a home run down the left field line. If it's fair, it is hooking. It is foul. A hanging curveball, and he hit it about eight miles, but foul. Well, the speed is the reason that he hits this ball foul. It's acted more like a change-up curveball than a regular full-speed curveball. So it's one and two to Creedy. He homered to left center back in the fourth inning on a high fastball on a two-strike count. Here it comes, and that one is up and away for a ball. Rodriguez has worked the last three innings. He's been in constant trouble, a perilous journey, but he's only allowed one run in those three innings. Here's the pitch, swing and a high pop-up. Shallow right field going down the line is Lamb. He's called up for the second baseman, Biggio. And Biggio makes the catch over toward the foul line. And shallow right. And Creedy is at number one. And nice pitching there by Rodriguez. You know, he hit a fastball up for a home run. A high fastball last time up where he threw him. Change up curveball, so forth. And then he came back with another high fastball. And he was late on it. I mean, consider what Wandy Rodriguez has done in his previous three innings. Now, he's only allowed one run, and that was on a home run. But he's given up four hits and four walks in those previous three innings. They put eight men on base against him and only scored one. That was on a homer. And there is ball one to Juan Uribe. Right-handed hitter. And he takes a fastball just a bit off the outside. 2-0. Chad Qualls, a right-hander, is warming up in the Houston bullpen. 
Uribe has doubled home a run and walked. Now a fastball. That's right over the outside corner for a called strike. And it is 2-1. And, and yet, although it's been painful to watch if you're an Astros fan, I'm sure, he's really done the job. There's a swing and a foul off to the right. I mean, he's kept him in the game. 2-2 two two the count now. Well, I guess if you're an Astro fan, you say he's kept him in the game. If you're a Chicago White Sox fan, you say the White Sox have kept him in the game yeah. by not they producing runs with the bases loaded. Not been able to get the big hit. This is swinging a foul off to the right. Let's pause here. The station identification. This is the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. Uribe with a check swing on a low curveball and on appeal, the first base umpire, Jeff Nelson, agrees with Uribe. No swing, he says. And so the count is three and two. Scott Pesednik is on deck. Four runs, eight hits for the White Sox. Three runs, five hits for the Astros. And the pitch is low, another walk. That is the fifth walk allowed by Rodriguez in three and a third innings. And here comes Phil Garner. And this is extremely interesting. He had Wandy Rodriguez, the lefty, face the first two hitters, both right-handed hitters. And now a left-handed hitter is coming up. And now he's bringing in the right-hander, Qualls. So with one on and one out, Qualls gets the call. Four to three White Sox, and the fans will sing Nana Hey Hey Goodbye. This call to the bullpen brought to you by Valvoline Max Life, engineered to help extend the life of your car. It's the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. Hey, boss. Yes? You know how we save so much time with each free carrier pickup we get from the U.S. Postal Service? Oh, sure. Well, I figure we can save even more time by using initials. Uh -huh. So instead of saying free carrier pickup, we just say FCP. Right. It'll save us valuable seconds each week. Initials, huh? Like a G-O-O-M-O. -O. Exactly, sir. What does that stand for? Get out of my office. You catch on quickly, sir. Go to USPS.com today. Print labels, pay for postage, and request a free carrier pickup. It's simple, and it's free. I'm worried that there are things that are going to burn me. I had to constantly be meeting people. Open house, that's somebody else's job. I figured I could sell it on my own to save a little bit of money. I don't even know enough to know that I don't know. The first thing we did was call a realtor. As soon as I saw that realtor art, he put me right at ease. If you're thinking about selling your home, you need some help. Ask your agent if they're a realtor, a member of the National Association of Realtors. For sale by owner, but not by this owner. A message from your local, state, and national realtor associations. Dan Schulman back with you in Chicago with the results of the AutoZone poll question. Get in the zone, AutoZone. The poll question tonight, which team will win the World Series? Only 7% thought the Astros in 4 or 5, 39%. The Astros in 6 or 7, 16%. The White Sox in 4 or 5, and 37%. The White Sox in 6 or 7. So the poll liked this game close so far. Here's the details on the pitching change for the Astros with John and Joe. All right, thanks, Dan. And Chad Qualls, 27 years old. We remember him from the postseason last year. Became an important man late in games in front of Brad Lynch for the Astros by late last season, but did not lose his rookie status. So he actually was one of the top rookies in the National League this year. 77 games he was in. He comes on to face Pasadnik with a runner at first. Makes a quick throw to first. And Uribe is back to the bag. So it's interesting. The left-hander, who had been struggling the whole time he was in there, Juan de Rodriguez, was left in to face two right-handed hitters. And then after walking the second of those, the lefty, Pesednik, comes up. And then he brings in the right-hander. Pesednik shows bunt and takes low one away for ball one. Well, what you also do is you allow Uribe at first base to run if they want to. You allow them to put the hit and run on. Usually... If you're concerned about running, you, you stay with the left-handed left -hand, pitcher. Yeah, but I guess he's not concerned. Over third base. 
Ensberg shallow, and Fasedic looks at ball two, and uh, Qualls stares in a little bit at the plate umpire Joe West, wondering where that one was. And Osmus kind of wants to know where it was, too. Fasedic out of the box, having a look at Joey Cora, the third base coach for the White Sox. Lamb on the bag at first with Uribe. Now the stretch, here it comes. Swing and a ground ball to second. Biggio to his left, has it. The second for the out there, Adam Everett, then jumps over the top of Uribe. And he played it very coolly and calmly, knowing that it wasn't a great shot to get a double play with Pacetti running anyway. Uh, and and Biggio had trouble getting it out of his glove. And therefore, they kind of lost the double play anyway. I don't think they could have turned it with Pacetti running. So here now is Chada Iguchi. Qualls had a, uh, an outstanding league championship series. And in fact, our colleagues Dan Shulman and Dave Campbell had listed him as their series MVP before Albert Pujols hit that home run in game five. There's the ball outside to Iguchi. He had retired everybody he'd faced 14 in a row. Four and two-thirds perfect innings late in games against the Cardinals in that series. And that's rather similar to what Qualls was doing late in games last year in the postseason. Pre-rookie. There goes Pesednik. The pitch gets away from Osmus. Pesednik slides into second base not knowing that the ball had rolled past Osmus and to the backstop. Had he been aware and I don't know how he could have been aware as he was focused on stealing the bag at second, he might have just kept on going over to third on that one. Well, if it's a straight steal, you do not look into the catcher uh, you, because it slows you down. And that was a straight steal, so therefore he would not have been able to look in and see that the ball got away. So Pesednik had 59 steals in the regular season and then had four more steals in the postseason. And now his fifth of this postseason. So he's at second. 2-0 the count to Iguchi. 4-3 to three White Sox. And there's a swing and a foul. That one bounces up and hits Iguchi. And Pesednik will steal third base. I don't know if this, situ this situation calls for that with two outs. But if there was one out, I think he might be trying to get a good jump and steal third base. 4-3. to three. The White Sox lead here in the last of the sixth inning. And again, a runner in scoring position, and they have not done well in these situations tonight as a team. The 2-1 pitch. Slider comes back on the inside and catches the corner for a called strike two. Two and two the count. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan on ESPN Radio bringing you the 101st World Series. This is game one in Chicago. Jermaine Dye on deck. He would be next. 2-2 two -two pitch. Swing and a miss. He struck him out. Man, that was a, a wicked-looking breaking ball. An unhittable-looking breaking ball. And the White Sox are now 1-4-8 with runners in scoring position. On to the seventh inning. Jeff Bagwell coming up. White Sox 4, Astros 3. It's the World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. three reasons I'll be at Home Depot's end of season savings event. Well, number three is 30% off. You, you gotta be kidding. Come on. Number two is they're not kidding. You, you get 30% off, you know, and the number one reason it's, it's that whole 30% off thing again. Hurry in now to the Home Depot and get 30% or more off all Yellow Tag merchandise throughout the store. It's the end of season savings event only at the Home Depot. You can do it. We can help. Valid in U.S. only. See store for details. How you doing? I'm Ken. Nice to meet you, Ken. I'm Bob. Nice party, huh? You bet, Ken. Listen, what kind of garage door opener you got? Uh, uh, automatic? Right. See, I'm talking about things like safety, security features, quiet operation, and speed. You got me? I don't know. You know what the heaviest moving object in your home is, Ken? Be my mother-in-law. <laughs> That's very funny, Ken. Thanks. Th this is important. Uh, it's actually your garage door. Uh, I have the power. Genie, garage door openers are all we think about. That's why we make such reliable openers and really lousy conversationalists. Look for Genie at your nearest home center or call your local Genie Pro dealer. Have you heard about Cherry Pepto-Bismol? Pink tastes even better than you think. 
Oh, nauseous heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea. Yay, Cherry Pepto. Nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea. Yay, Cherry Pepto. Five stomach problems, one great taste. Use as directed. Pepto's gone cherry. I'm an artist. I enjoy working with airbrush, acrylics, and watercolors. John White, Max Life Motor Oil user. So here in the garage is where I keep my real work of art. My 74Z with over 200,000 miles on it. I use Valvoline Max Life, so I don't have problems with oil leaks and drip. This artwork is not for sale. Valvoline Max Life Motor Oil has added ingredients that reduce leaks by conditioning engine seals. At 75,000, time to switch to Max Life. Here come the Astros into the seventh inning. It is four to three. The White Sox are leading as Jeff Bagwell stands in against Jose Contreras. Game one of the World Series on ESPN Radio. Contreras to the plate and catches the inside corner to Bagwell for the fastball for strike one call. The last time up, John, he had a ball to left center field, and I think because his shoulder's still weak in a weakened state, that ball didn't go out because he hit it solidly, but he didn't get it out of the ballpark. One strike delivery, and that hit him again. He tried to throw some kind of a, an off-speed pitch on the inside, and it hit Bagwell on the leg. Bagwell literally did nothing whatsoever to get out of the way of that one. And, I mean, he's kind of hampered in that regard right. because his feet are so wide apart, it would be difficult for him to, to do much there, but it looked like he took one for the team there. Well, it hit him on his right thigh because it, it passed him in the front. Then got him on his rear leg, but that's the second time he's been hit by Contreras. So it tells you that they must be want, they trying to they're trying to pitch him inside, which is where most people pitch him. So Bagwell, the possible tying run is aboard, and here is Jason Lane, right-handed hitter, swings and lifts a high pop-up back of first, going down the line in foul ground is Canerco. He staggers under it, but makes the catch. Iguchi got over rather late, and I think. The way Konerko was going after that one, he needed help. He needed some help, yeah. <laughs> but then he, he sort of regrouped and he handled it. One of my favorite Tony Perez stories is there was a pop-up like that down the line one day and I'm playing with him. And Tony said he got it. I let him try to catch it. He dropped it in candlestick with the wind. And I got back in the dugout and Sparky's yelling at me. <laughs> you know, it's just, you knew he needed help. You should have helped him. And Aguchi knew that he needed help. He should have helped Konerko yeah. there. Konerko... Started as if the ball was going to be much more foul than it was. Yeah. And then he had to kind of reverse his field, and he was doing it while he was running backward. <laughs> Bangwell stood at first. Here's Brad Osmus. Look out. And a fastball that runs inside, and it got him. Well, John, one of the things that happens when you drop down as he's doing, the ball definitely tails in. And if you don't get the ball away, well, you know, you're going to hit some hitters. That fastball, he drops down, and the ball just tails in. It runs in, and... The hitters are, you know, not not getting out of the way, so they're getting hit. I've never seen two hitters in the same game who seem to be the last to know that they'd been hit by pitches. <laughs> this, it happened just now with Osmus. We're looking at television replays, and it is not evident from those replays that he got hit. He gave no reaction to himself as if he thought he'd been hit. And the same thing happened to Bagwell back in the second inning. So two hit batsmen have fueled a possible rally here for the Astros, and Adam Everett stands in. He's in into a force out and a, just a ground out. His last time, he is 0 for 2, and he fouls one straight back toward the press box. And for the first time tonight, the Chicago bullpen is going to get busy. Cliff Polite, a right-hander, is up, and uh, the left-hander, Neil Cotts, is going to join him out there. Two men on, one man out. Four to three White Sox. The pitch. Swinging a ground ball to short. Not hit that hard. The rebound a second one. Iguchi to first. Not in time. Everett runs pretty well. And that ball was not hit real sharply. But they still almost doubled him up. Well, the ball is it was hit in the hole a little bit. So it wasn't hit a perfect double play ball. But they do turn it pretty quickly. And Everett barely beats it at first. So Bagwell moves over to third base. Everett safe at first base. And here is Craig Biggio, the leadoff man, to try and be an RBI man. 
Good call at first base by Jeff Nelson. Adam Everett was clearly safe. So now Biggio, he has grounded out to third. Singled and scored a run and grounded out to third again. Right-headed swinger, runners at first and third. White Sox lead four to three. The pitch, ground ball to third. Diving is Creedy. He's got another one up to his feet and he throws him out at first. The side is retired. They better find somebody other than Brooks Robinson to pick on over there. <laughs> Joe Creedy doing his best imitation of the great Hall of Famer of the Baltimore Orioles and the hero of the 1970 World Series. That's it. And now we head into the seventh inning stretch. It is four to three. The White Sox are leading. The seventh inning stretch is brought to you by new extra strength roll aids, soft chews, chewy, not chalky, for a whole new kind of heartburn relief. Here is the voice of U.S. Cellular Field, Gene Honda. Recording artist, Liz Fair. You know how we save so much time with each free carrier pickup we get from the U.S. Postal Service? Oh, sure. Well, I figure we can save even more time by using initials. Uh -huh. So instead of saying free carrier pickup, we just say FCP. Right. It'll save us valuable seconds each week. Initials, huh? Like a G-O-O-M-O. -O. Exactly, sir. What does that stand for? Get out of my office. You catch on quickly, sir. Go to USPS.com today. Print labels, pay for postage, and request a free carrier pickup. It's simple, and it's free. I didn't know what the first step was to take. It was my first time buying a home. Stacks and stacks of paperwork. I want a big backyard so I can play with all my friends. When it's your first house, you don't know what the process is like. And the first thing we did was call a realtor. So how do you know when you're working with a realtor? Look for the realtor R. Buying a home for the first time? Let someone with experience and knowledge guide you. Ask your agent if they're a realtor. A member of the National Association of Realtors. I'm the landlord, the gardener, and handyman. A message from your local, state, and national realtor associations. You're now seeing live pictures of a lunar module. And here they are all the way from Liverpool. There are thousands marching on Washington as we... A generation as unique as this needs a new generation of personal financial planning. We are the personal advisors of Ameriprise Financial, formerly American Express Financial Advisors. To set up an appointment with a local financial advisor today, call 1-800-AMERIPRISE. That's 1-800-263-7477. Ameriprise Financial Services, member NASD and SIPC. See Jack run, run, run. See Jack throw, throw, throw. See Jack jump, jump, jump. See Jack take steroids, steroids, steroids. In case you didn't know. See Jack get liver damage. Steroids don't make great athletes. See Jack have a stroke, stroke. They destroy them. See Jack stunt his bone growth. Talk to your kids about steroids. See Jack have a heart attack. Need help? Heart attack. Get help. Heart attack. Visit drugfree.org. This message brought to you by the Partnership for a Drug-Free America and Major League Baseball Charities. Now the White Sox into the last half of the seventh inning from Chicago. Game one of the 2005 World Series. The White Sox holding on to a 4-3 lead. 
And here comes Jermaine Dye, Paul Canerco, and Carl Everett. The numbers three, four, five hitters in the White Sox batting order. The big sluggers. And Chad Qualls, the third Astros pitcher of the game. Coming up, here's the pitch now. Fastball up and away to Dye for ball one. Dye has homered to right. And then against, that was against Clemens before Clemens left with the strain of his left hamstring. And Dye walked twice against Wandy Rodriguez. Now facing Qualls. And there's a slider on the inside. That stays off the corner for a ball. 2-0. The fans going to get on Joe West sarcastically as if saying, wait a minute, he was hit, wasn't he? <laughs> In the White Sox bullpen, left-hander Damaso Marte has started to warm up now. Canerco on deck. The 2-0 pitch. Way outside for a ball. And it is 3-0. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. ESPN Radio bringing you the 101st World Series. Tomorrow night, game two, Andy Pettit and Mark Burley. The 3-0 pitch. Right down the middle for a called strike with a fastball. And it is 3-1. 41,206. The official paid crowd at... U.S. Cellular Field on the south side of Chicago. 3-1 pitch. Swinging a bounding ball to shortstop. High hop. Fielded by Everett. The throw to first. In the dirt. And off the glove of Lamb. It rolls over to the box seat railing. And Die, after overrunning the bag at first, will just stay put there. The ball stayed on the field of play. And he decided not to risk it. Well, Everett's throw just was a sinker. And Lamb really didn't have a shot at that one. You know, a lot of times your first baseman can pick you up. But it was kind of out in front, and it was a really in-between hop. So a throwing error by Everett. And that is the first error of this World Series. And here comes Konerko. Was kind of a big chopper, and I think Everett thought he had to hurry that throw a little bit. Yeah, and he had more time than he thought. So now, Konerko, he is rounded out to short and hit two singles and he takes a called strike at his own one Canerco single to right in the third inning and single to center in the fifth inning so he is two for three in the game White Sox four Astros three last of the seventh here's a stretch a one strike pitch slider just missing on the outside and the calls look like he wanted that call from plate umpire Joe West. One ball, one strike. Cool night in Chicago. 53 degrees at game time. And the temperature's down into the 40s now. Bobby Jenks, the right-hander, has joined Marte, the left-hander, the White Sox bullpen. And there's a low fastball, a sinker, swung on and missed. Strike two by Canerco. That one came in at 94 miles an hour. And had a lot of sinking action on it. One ball, two strikes now. Carl Everett is on deck. Lamb at first base on the back, holding against Dye. The middle infielders, double play depth, pulled in a bit from the outfield grass. And Qualls with a quick throw to first, back to the bag, is Dye. Shortstop, Everett, the second baseman, Biggio, both uh, two or three steps in from the outfield grass. And Biggio, one over toward the middle against the slugging Conurco. The right side of the infield, almost wide open with Lamb on the bag. The outfield is deep, shaded a bit toward left. One-two pitch. On the fists, rolled foul off to the left. And I think he cracked his bat on that one, or he thinks he might have. He walks away looking at the bat. And he taps the handle end in the fungo circle to make sure it's all still in one solid piece. And apparently he's convinced that it is. And on a cold night like tonight, that's got to sting your hands a little bit, doesn't it? Well, cold nights, you try to keep them out of your kitchen or off your handle of the bat. So that was a very uncomfortable foul ball for Canerco. There's the throw to first, and Die is back to the bag standing. And, and Qualls is tough for right-handers because his fastball runs in on them, and his slider is breaking away sharply. So that's two contrasting pitches, and those are the guys that bother you the most. They can run it in on your hands and slide it away. One-two pitch. Swing and a ground ball foul on the third base side. Another 94-mile-an-hour fastball from Chad Qualls. And if you're a Qualls, you got to have to realize that if I get the sinker over the plate, he's going to get the ground ball. Now, whether they ground it at one of my infielders or not is another story, but I can get the ground ball with the sinker. 
And they're gone. In a, uh, a battle here with, with Qualls. There goes Dye. Oh, man. And he's right out in the middle. And Qualls steps off the slab, throws the ball to Biggio at second, the throw back to first, a slide by Dye, and he's safe at first. Jermaine Dye took off before Qualls broke from his stretch. And then Qualls, instead of running right toward him, threw the ball to second base to Biggio just as Dye started back to first base. And Dye, with a good slide, was able to beat the throw at first. I don't think I've ever seen a guy that far out. I've seen guys take off before the pitcher throws. But Dye was, I mean, he was three-quarters of the way to second base almost. I mean, he just, I can't believe how far he was off before Qualls realized that he was, you know, running. And Lamb, if he'd have stayed with him at first base, he would have had him out because he overslid the bag. Lamb just missed the tag over there. Now the pitch to Canerco, a high drive into right center field, medium deep. Back and under it is Lane near the warning track. He makes the catch. Lane, who's a right-handed hitter, but a left-handed thrower, a la Ricky Henderson, throws the ball back to the infield with Dye back to first. One away. I, I just never seen that with a right-handed pitcher, a guy take off and run that many steps before the pitcher realizes he's running. Well, Qualls, I don't know what kept Qualls in the stretch for such a long yeah, time. that's what I mean. I don't understand it. He was just stayed there, and, and Dye was running. And then he didn't pick him off. <laughs> didn't get him. <laughs> Here's Carl Everett. He has singled and scored a run, struck out, and had a sacrifice bunt. Batting left-handed again. Swings and foul tips it into the glove. A Brad Ausmus strike one. White Sox lead four to three. Last of the seventh inning. You know, a guy who does that a lot, as we saw die, the guy who fixed, thinks he's picked up something from a pitcher, and he thinks he can just go ahead and leave, even before the first move by the pitcher. Omar Vizquel does that a lot. Former Cleveland Indian this year with the Giants. Everett swings, hits a fly ball into medium left field, in and to his right. Now backing up as the wind carries it, Berkman. Berkman makes the catch, out number two. Marte now has taken a seat in the White Sox bullpen. And Neil Cox, a left-hander, gets back up again. That's all we've seen from the White Sox bullpen since game one of the league championship series when Neil Cox got the final two outs in the ninth inning of that game in relief of Contreras, all we've seen from them is guys warming up in the bullpen. Other than Cox, nobody in that White Sox bullpen has thrown in a game in 15 days. And Ozzy Guillen is not quite sure what he's going to get when the time comes for him to actually go to the bullpen. Here's Aaron Rowan, the right-handed hitter, and he grounds one foul off to the left. I mean, they've been doing a lot of throwing. They threw some simulated games and and various things like that. They're not like they've just been sitting around playing cards the whole time. But they have not pitched in a game in more than two weeks. On one, the count to Aaron Rowan. He is singled. That was in that two-run third, uh, second inning rally. Hit into a force play and been walked intentionally. One strike to count. Die at first. The pitch, a slider in there for a called strike and it's 0-2 so you're telling me you never did that you never just took off when the no, guy was in the no, stretch no I always believed that I could read a guy and, and go on his first move but to take off I, I just don't see that <laughs> I can understand it with a left handed pitcher out there though now the pitch swing and a miss on a slider a sharp Slider down in the way. Strike three. The inning is over. An error, a blown pickoff, but no runs for the White Sox. One man stranded. They've left eight men on. Now the hitters coming up for the Astros. Tavares, Berkman, and Ensberg. We go to the eighth. Four to three, Chicago. It's the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. It will continue after these messages from your local station.
If you like Italian food as much as I do, then let me tell you about the two best places to get it. Genovese's, 116 Dunlawton Avenue in the Shores, 767-4151, or Genovese's at 183 East Granada Boulevard, Ormond Beach, 677-3222, proudly serving you since 1981 with the best pizza, pasta, and salads anywhere. No pre-made frozen crusts or conveyor ovens here. Uh-uh, Genovese's makes everything fresh from scratch the way it should be made and delivers it hot and fresh right to you. And take my word for it, Genovese's has the most authentic New York pizza south of the city. And there's spaghetti or ziti with marinara sauce and meatballs or sausage, fettuccine alfredo, chicken or eggplant parmesan are true Italian delicacies. That's Genovese's Italian Cafe, 116 Dunlawton Avenue in the Shores, 767-4151 or 183 East Granada Boulevard, 677-3222. Eat in, take out, or we deliver. Genovese's, limited delivery area. Where can you find the lowest mileage, cleanest pre-owned vehicles in Central Florida? At Sunrise on Ridgewood in Holly Hill. At Sunrise, you get all the advantages of new vehicles without the depreciation. That's right. Why pay the difference if you can't tell the difference? New car dealers offer 0% financing. So does Sunrise. New car dealers offer extended terms. So does Sunrise. New car dealers offer vehicles with factory warranties. So does Sunrise. All of Sunrise's vehicles come with their exclusive worry-free warranty. New car dealers offers zero down. So does Sunrise. New car dealers back their sales departments with state-of-the-art service departments. So does Sunrise. New cars and trucks depreciate up to 50% when you take them off the lot. Not at Sunrise. You buy like new vehicles after the depreciation. So at Sunrise, you'll not only get a great deal, but you'll get a great deal more. Stop by Sunrise on Richwood and Holly Hill today for the best selection of the nicest cars in Central Florida. At Sunrise, we're committed to excellence. Tire City, Volusia County's largest tire warehouse, has the names you know and trust. Pirelli's, Goodyear, Michelin, BF Goodrich, Cooper, and more, with discounted prices on new and used tires. Tire City, family-owned for 15 years, has brake specials, mufflers, and CV axles. Fuel injector service, $59.99 for most cars. Buy four new or used tires and get a free oil change. That's Tire City, muffler and repair shop, 1178 South Nova Road, Ormond Beach, 677-0160. Tire installation while you wait. Open six days a week at Tire City. Eight. Jinx doesn't come in to finish the night. He's facing the big hitters right here. You've got the guy who can uh, make things happen with a bunt or a ground ball, Tavares, and then the power behind him. He shows bunt and then takes a called strike at his 0-1. Tavares has popped up to short. He's had a sacrifice bunt, although he was trying for a hit, we believe. And then he hit a double to left center in the sixth inning. A right-handed swinger. Creedy shallow at third for him. The pitch. Swing. There's a drive in the left center field. Hit well. Going back is Rowan. He's going to have to chase it. That ball is off the base of the wall. Tavares to second, turns the corner, and he'll stop there as Rowan hurries the ball into the relay man, the shortstop Uribe. So Tavares hits one to almost the same spot as his double in the sixth inning. And again, as it did in the sixth inning, this double starts the inning. And we saw last time Berkman pulled it to the right side, got him over. But I think we're going to see a different look here because out comes Ozzie again. He's got Cots the lefty and Jenks the righty up in the bullpen and most in the National League most managers like to make Berkman swing right handed. Well not only that John you keep him almost from hitting the pulling the ball to the right side and move him over to third like he did last time. Now he has to force it to the right side. Well Contreras leaves and he gets a lusty ovation for the big crowd here in Chicago. So the left-hander, Cox, is coming in. Berkman will bat right-handed with the runner at second, and nobody out. Four to three, Chicago leading in the eighth. This call to the bullpen is brought to you by Valvoline Max Life, engineered to help extend the life of your car. It's the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service. nights this time of year coupled with the wet winter weather you can expect more hazardous driving conditions ahead you need to get to AutoZone so you can see clearly and drive safely replace your burned out headlights taillights and turn signals and put a new set of wiper blades on your car don't get a ticket or cause an accident get to AutoZone and drive safely get the zone. AutoZone Mr. Shatner 
Are you telling the court that Priceline saves you up to $100 a flight off other leading sites? I believe I am. Come on. Airfares are all about the same. No, they're not. What evidence do you have? When you name your own price, Priceline finds the best flight for you. The airlines give us huge discounts, which we then pass on to you. Huh. I, uh... Bet you could use a vacation right about now. Priceline. Save like nowhere else. Airline and flight times shown only after purchase. Welcome back to Chicago. Time now for our Did You Know, brought to you by OnStar. When something unpredictable happens on the road, it's nice to have 24-hour assistance of OnStar. Well, something unpredictable, a pitching change by the White Sox. As you know, four consecutive complete game victories for the White Sox in the ALCS. The last time that happened in the playoffs, the 1928 Yankees had four consecutive complete game victories. The last time it happened in the regular season, 1983, the Texas Rangers. It had been over 20 years since any team, anywhere, anytime, had four consecutive complete game victories. Well, Ozzie Guillen finally has gone to the bullpen to tell you all about it. Back to John and Joe. Thanks, Dan, and it will be Neil Kotz. And he's the guy who hasn't had such a long layoff. Uh, Kotz, he just pitched, what, uh, 12 days ago? In game one of the league championship series, he pitched to the final two hitters in game one that the Angels got the win the the one time that they beat the White Sox. Well, what, what Ozzy's trying to do here is force Bergman to give himself up if he hits it to the right side. You know, if he's a left-handed hitter like he was last time up with a runner's second, he could pull the ball and try to get a base hit. Now he'd have to give himself up to go that way. Here's a fastball to him on the inside for a called strike one. And I'm not sure if you're Phil Garner that you want Berkman to give anything up. He's your best hitter. Now the one-strike delivery. And a pop foul that will come back out of play. Another fastball. There. And this is not unusual. Left-handers will come right after Berkman most often. Not that he is a bad hitter right-handed. He hit 294. But he's not a power hitter right-handed. He had only three home runs in 126 at-bats right-handed. Left-handed, he averaged a home run every 16 or at-bats or so. Here's the pitch. Low and inside with a slider, and the count is one and two. Cox had an excellent year for the White Sox. The White Sox bullpen, as a group, had an excellent year. Cox had a 1.94 ERA. 60 and a third innings pitched, only 38 hits allowed. He works off the extreme third base edge of the pitching slab. Runner at second. The pitch low for a ball. A 92 mile an hour fastball missing a little bit low. On deck, Morgan Ensberg. Berkman, the third place hitter, maybe the Astros' best all round hitter. Ensberg, the home run and RBI leader this year, on deck. A right handed hitter. Jenks, a right hander up in the bullpen. 2 2 pitch. Swing and a smash into left field, a base hit. Here comes Tavares to third base, and he's going to stop there. He held up for a moment when that ball was hit to make sure that it wasn't going to be caught by somebody in front of him. So Tavares to third. Berkman with a solid single to left field. And the batter, Ensberg, coming up, a right-handed hitter. Well, he ended up throwing him a high breaking ball, and, I mean, he nailed it in the right field. I mean, the left field for a base hit. And it was hit so hard, Tavares couldn't even score even after he waited for it to go through. And listen to how quiet it is in this ballpark now where it's been so noisy, so electric almost all night long. I mean, they're just like everybody else, just like Ozzie Guillen, maybe, fearing what would happen when Ozzie finally went to the bullpen. What are they going to get? Well, he threw strikes. That's all you can ask. So here is Ensberg, and he swings at a pitch up out of the strike zone. Kind of a wild swing at a high fastball and at his own one. Well, that was actually a good high, good high fastball, and if you want to swing at it, go ahead. You're not going to do a lot with it, so. Tavares at third, Berkman at first, the pitch. And that's down and in for a ball, one ball, one strike. Four to three, the White Sox with the lead here in the eighth, that lead in considerable jeopardy right now. Hansberg stepped out for a moment, had a look at his third base coach. Doug Mansolino. Now the pitch. That is low for a ball. Well, Two and one. If you're Ensberg, your job is to make sure you put the ball in play. Because as you mentioned before, even if you hit a ground ball, then 
they'll it'll score a run even if they double you up at first base and we're in the eighth inning you have to tie the game as quickly as possible you don't want to go to the ninth inning or later into this inning trying to tie the game they're playing for the double play in the middle of the infield there's a called strike two and now it's two and two well, Ensberg did not think it was strike two A little, like a little cutter that ran down and in on him. He thought it was too low. Two and two the count. Tavares at third. Berkman at first. Infield double play depth. The pitch. Swing and a miss. He struck it out. And Ensberg is 0 for 4 tonight. That's a spot or even a double play ball works well for the Astros. Well, he was in that situation last time up. He did hit it hard, but he did still left the runner at third base. But he's in the same situation again, and this time he's not able to make contact. I think that was pretty good pitching. Two high fastballs put him away. Now Mike Lamb, a left-handed hitter. The infield double play depth. The pitch in the dirt. One ball and no strikes, and Lamb held up the stop sign for Tavares to indicate that Yes, Brzezinski came up with that one. Don't come down. Four to three White Sox. Now, you might say, well, how come Garner is not putting up a, a pinch hitter here for Lamb? Well, the White Sox had that bullpen going. There's a swing and a foul. Back and out of play. They got Jenks, the right-hander, warming up. And he has one switch hitter available on his uh, bench. That is Jose Vizcaino. But right here, he's staying with Lamb. And one thing for sure, if Cots can get the double play ball now, the inning ends with nobody scoring. Here it comes. And there's a ball off the outside, a fastball missing. And it is two and one. Tavares at third, the possible tying run. Berkman at first, the possible go-ahead run. Eighth inning, one out. Two-one pitch. Swing and a miss, strike two. I tell you what, his fastball's got some good movement on it when he gets it up a little bit. We got Ensberg on the high fastball. Now he gets Lamb to swing through that high fastball. And like you said, it has a little cutting action on it, but it's got a lot of movement upstairs. Two and two the count. Cox delivers. And a check swing foul. The ball glancing inadvertently off the bat of Lamb as he checked his swing. And that ended up trying to get out of the way of that ball. Well, the ball fouled back into the crowd. Another high fastball. Good spot. I think that was the right pitch. All right, so he went up and in with the fastball. Let's see what happens now. He throws. Swing and a miss. He struck it out. He went to the outside. So with runners at first and third, he has struck out both Ensberg and Lamb. And here comes Bagwell. And that will bring out Ozzie Guillen. Yeah, I, I didn't think he would let him pitch the Bagwell in this situation. Well, you have two outs now, see? So Jinx, if he comes in, he would only be required to get four outs if he can get out of this jam. So he is calling for Jinx. He's calling with his arm motion, big guy he wants. <laughs> so now... Bill Garner will have to decide, is it going to be Bagwell? He's got Orlando Palmero and Jose Vizcaino who can swing left-handed. But it is Jeff Bagwell that we're talking about here. Four to three White Sox. Runners at first and third, two down. With this pitching change, we'll step out for a moment. This is the World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. Hey, boss. Yes? You know how we save so much time with each free carrier pickup we get from the U.S. Postal Service? Oh, sure. Well, I figure we can save even more time by using initials. Uh -huh. So instead of saying free carrier pickup, we just say FCP. Right. It'll save us valuable seconds each week. Initials, huh? Like a G-O-O-M-O. -O -O. Exactly, sir. What does that stand for? Get out of my office. You catch on quickly, sir. Go to USPS.com today. Print labels, pay for postage, and request a free carrier pickup. It's simple and it's free. 
I'm worried that there are things that are going to burn me. I had to constantly be meeting people. Open house, that's somebody else's job. I figured I could sell it on my own to save a little bit of money. I don't even know enough to know that I don't know. The first thing we did was call a realtor. As soon as I saw that realtor art, he put me right at ease. If you're thinking about selling your home, you need some help. Ask your agent if they're a realtor, a member of the National Association of Realtors. For sale by owner, but not by this owner. A message from your local, state, and national realtor associations. Back at Chicago, Dan Schulman with you at U.S. Cellular Field. This game also being broadcast on ESPN Deportes Radio with Jaime Harin and Eduardo Ortega. And right now on ESPN Deportes Television, the UEFA Champions League, the most prestigious club soccer tournament in the world. Real Madrid, Manchester United, Juventus, and many more. And beginning November 7th, watches the greatest players in the major leagues come home for high-powered baseball in the highly competitive Dominican Baseball League. Watch it on ESPN Deportes, now available on Dish Network. Another pitching change for the White Sox with the details, John and Joe. All right, thanks, Dan, and... Uh... Here is Bobby Jenks, the 24-year-old right-hander from Southern California. He was with the Angels in their farm system, and they finally took him off the roster, and the White Sox grabbed him. I mean, a lot of teams would grab a guy who has the ability to throw 100 miles an hour. So here is Jenks. He ended up becoming the White Sox closer with about two weeks left in the regular season because Dustin Hermanson had problems with his back and they finally, uh, Ozzy Guillen just said, well, you know, we don't know if day to day if he's going to be able to close tonight or not. So finally just said, this guy's pitching so well, let's just make him the closer. So Bobby Jenks, now keep in mind that this is the first time he's pitched in a game in more than two weeks. Over at first base, a pinch runner comes in for Berkman. That is Chris Burke. So Burke, the pinch runner at first base, Burke had 11 steals this year. Runners at first and third, two down. Bagwell is up there to bat for himself. The pitch, a fastball, swung on and missed, strike one. That was a real fastball. That wasn't just a fastball. That thing exploded. And Jeff Bagwell had no chance on it. He was really late on it, high fastball. I mean, if he can throw three of those, you're going to have a problem. That was 99 miles an hour. I could see the difference just from up here. I didn't know that was what it was on the radar gun, but that one exploded. Tavares at third. Berkman at, or rather, uh, Burke now at first base. There goes Burke. The pitch, a swing and a foul back to the screen. Again, 99 miles an hour. Bagwell at least looked like he had a chance that time. Well, it was a, another high fastball. That was tough. But I, I, that's why you put Chris Burke in. I thought they might wait till two strikes and try a double steal with Tavares at first, at third, and Burke at first. But I think if you're the White Sox, you just got to go after the hitter. First and third, two down. Four to three White Sox. Burke runs the pitch. Very high for a ball. And the White Sox, even though Burke represents the possible go-ahead run in the eighth inning, they've said from the get-go, let him go. Yeah, and, and I could see that just by the way they were playing. All you have to do is look at the infield. The infield, the shortstop, the second baseman were all the way back, so they're not going to cover the bag. Nobody went to cover. One and two to Bagwell. Tavares bluffs down the line from third. Jinks to the plate. Very high again and tight. Bagwell lurched back out of the way of that one. Well, the, I give it... The Astros credit, they're trying to do everything to upset him. They stole the base. Tavares is running down the line. And they're just trying to do anything they can to upset Jinx and still a run here. He's ready. 2-2 two -two pitch. Fastball swung on and fouled back into the upper deck. And Jeff Bagwell, he had the surgery on his shoulder. We were there back in May soon after it happened when Bagwell said, hey, you know, it could well be my career is over. He came back in September. They used him as a pinch hitter. He did a great job in that role. Had some big hits. And he did the same. He had a big RBI as a pinch hitter in the postseason. Now the designated hitter tonight. The first start that he's made in five and a half months. But I tell you what, he's glad that he was in the game and not coming in to pinch hit in this situation. I guarantee you that. At least he's been able to see some pitches from other pitchers and, and sort of get ready for Jinx. Two and two, the count to Bagwell. Runners at second and third, two down. 
Here's the stretch. The 2-2 two -two pitch on the way. Swing and a miss. He struck it out. And the radar gun in the stadium says 100 miles an hour. Jenks heads off the mound, and this crowd is on its feet. Bobby Jenks with some power pitching to an extreme. The Astros again not able to get that runner home. It's turned into a long night of frustration for the Astros. Still 4-3, to three, Chicago. We go to the last of the eighth. It's the World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. Presenting Louise, who's about to retire. She's been a babysitter. <laughs> Dishwasher, hostess, waitress, order up, photographer, musician. I was thinking about love the other day. Ski instructor, world traveler, wife. Do you take this man to be your? I do. Mother, stenographer, law student, lawyer. Your Honor, I object. Politician, lobbyist, grandmother, and once again, <laughs> babysitter. <laughs> Reaching retirement is no small achievement. We'll help you make the most of it. Because if you're anything like Louise, you probably have a few questions about what's next. Fidelity Retirement Income Advantage. We'll help you develop an income plan, figure out what investment products may be right for you, and then help simplify and manage all of your income and expenses from one account. Is your retirement on track? Find out in about 30 minutes. Call today, 1-800-FIDELITY. Fidelity Investments. Smart move. Fidelity Brokerage Services. Member NYSE SIPC. Hey, I told you guys, no spitting in the dugout. Ah, oh, Coach, it's these chalky, gritty antacids. I can't stand them. Well, you ought to try Rolaid Soft Chews. They're chewy, not chalky. Really? Yeah, with a taste and texture antacid users prefer to Tumsy Eggs. Mmm, great. Well, and they really wipe out tough heartburn fast. Hey, Coach, what makes you such an expert on Rolaid Soft Chews anyway? <laughs> you kidding? The way you've been playing? Rolaid Soft Chews. Chewy, not chalky. Preference based on consumer test. Use as directed. Hey, neighbor, I'm thinking about getting a GMC. Sierra pickup. Which one would you recommend? Doesn't matter. What? You, Mr. Sierra, says it doesn't matter? Well, Sierra's torque makes it the most powerful line of V8s available. It's like asking which mallet should you use to crush a bug? Which linebacker should you get to open a pickle jar? Which thoroughbred should you hire for pony rides at your kid's birthday? I get the idea. Good, because I was beginning to run out of metaphors. No matter how you use your GMC truck, we engineer them all to the highest standard, professional grade. The veteran right-hander, 36-year-old Russ Springer, comes on to pitch for the Houston Astros, the fourth Astros pitcher of the game. And he'll face A.J. Przinski, left-handed hitter of the pitch. Fastball inside for ball one. Chris Burke stays in to play left field, replacing Berkman. And in the Chicago bullpen now, El Duque, Orlando Hernandez, is getting ready. There's a slider, and that's too low, 2-0 oh, to Brzezinski, who's knocked in a run on a, on a force out, grounded out the first, and grounded into a bases-loaded inning-ending double play. And one thing we're all worried about was what the how effective would the bullpen be coming out of the, you know, for Chicago. Well, so far, they've come in throwing strikes, and they've done a great job. 2-0 oh pitch, swing on the ground ball, headed for right field, and through, base hit. is the ninth hit of the game for the White Sox. And it will bring up Joe Creedy. So, Joe, your uh, assessment of Bobby Jenks. Well, I'll tell you what. He's got some giddy-up on the fastball. I know that. I mean, he he is a real hard throw. And it's a live fastball. It's not just a 99 miles an hour and straight. It's live. And then that last one to Bagwell at 100 miles an hour on the stadium radar gun. And that was what you're talking about. That had a little movement. A little movement running away from Bagwell. Now here's Creedy. And he looks at a called strike in his 0-1. Creedy has grounded out to third. Homered to left center. That home run came in the fourth inning. And it broke a 3-3 tie. And made it 4-3. Neither team has scored since. It is still 4-3 White Sox here in the last of the eighth inning. Creedy popped up to second his last time. Brzezinski at first. Lamb on the bag with him. The pitch is swung out and fouled. Back out of play. Let's pause 10 seconds for station ID. This is the World Series on ESPN Radio. Delivered by the United States Postal Service. 
on Daytona Sports Source, 1380 WELE, Ormond Beach, Florida. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan on ESPN Radio at the World Series. Game one, and the pitch to Creedy just misses for a ball. One ball, two strikes. Game two tomorrow night. A couple of the uh, top left-handers in the game. Andy Pettit, the veteran of so many World Series and postseason games, against Mark Burley, the ace lefty of the White Sox staff. Brzezinski at first. The middle infielders, Everett at short. Bijou at second. Double play deck. One-two pitch. Reach for and foul back to the screen. Cut fastball that may have run off the outside. And a, uh, a good save there by Creedy. Now, is it just me, or does it seem like it's gotten a little cooler as the evening has gone along? Well, I'm sure it is a little cooler, but, but the players don't feel it right now. They're into this game. One and two the count. He throws. Curveball popped up foul off to the right, and that will drop into the lower deck. Tomorrow night, game two, Burley for the White Sox, Pettit for the Astros. And we'll have it on the radio. Our broadcast time tomorrow, 7.35 Eastern Time, 6.35 Central. And the first pitch should be a little bit after 8 o'clock Eastern, about 8.15 Eastern. Now the pitch. Again, he lunges at one, lifts a fly ball into right center. Over to his right is Lane, and he makes the catch. Przinsky tags up at first and bluffs as if heading for second base. Lane throws back in, and Przinsky will go back to first. One away. And here comes Uribe. Four to three, the White Sox leading. White Sox got a run in the first on Dyes Homer. The Astros tied it in the second on Lamb's homer. But the White Sox got two in the second. Krasinski and Uribe with the RBIs for a 3-1 to one lead. There's a throw to first and back to the bag is Krasinski. But in the third inning, Berkman got a clutch. Two out, two run double. That tied the game again. And the White Sox untied it in the fourth inning on a home run by Creedy. But there has been no further scoring. Four to three, White Sox. Last of the eighth. And a good fastball to the outside corner for a called strike. And one at 92 miles an hour to Uribe. Uribe doubled home a run, the third White Sox run of the game back in the second inning. Since then, he has walked twice. White Sox have nine hits. They've received five walks, plus a base runner on an error. So they've had 15 men on base in this game. But just the four runs. In the fourth and fifth innings, each of those innings ended with men on base and double play balls. They've only had one hit in eight at-bats as a team with runners in scoring position. But they still lead four to three. One strike pitch. Curveball inside. One ball, one strike. The Astros, meanwhile, they have their own frustrations. They haven't had as many base runners or as many threats, but in the sixth inning, they got a leadoff double from Tavares and did not score. In the eighth inning, a leadoff double followed by a single. They had first and third and nobody out and did not score again. There's a breaking ball lifted to left field, shallow. Racing in is Burke, still coming, and he gets there and makes the catch. Well, speed can overcome that first mistake. He made a mistake and didn't get a good read on the ball, but he has a lot of speed, and he was able to make up the difference. Looks like his first step was back. So Przinsky still at first base. Two down, and here is Scott Pesednik, the leadoff man. Pesednik is grounded out to short, struck out. He is singled to center and grounded into a force play. One for four. He also has a steal tonight. Four to three, White Sox lead last of the eighth. In the ninth inning, the Astros will have Jason Lane, Brad Osmus, and Adam Everett do up. So they do have a couple of left-handed possibilities for pinch-hitting duties. There's a curveball in there. Strike one, two, plus percentage. And maybe, Joe, you know, I was asking him how come Lamb was still up there. 
with one out against the left-hander. And maybe that's the answer. Maybe he wanted to save the the switcher to Vizcaino and the lefty Palmero for the ninth inning for Osmus and Everett. One on the count. The pitch. Fastball missing inside. One ball, one strike. Bobby Jenks. And with an impressive World Series debut, blowing away Jeff Bagwell with a 100-mile-an-hour fastball. The 1-1 pitch. Swing and a miss. High fastball, and Pesetnik chased it. The interesting thing about the last inning, John, is the Astros only had two strikeouts in the ball game through seven innings, and all three of them struck out with runners at first and third in the ninth and the eighth inning. Yeah. So the White Sox did exactly what they needed to do at that moment. Cox came in, struck out Ensberg and Lamb. Jinx got Bagwell. And there goes Przinski. They were not holding him. And he just took off while Springer was still in his set position. And uh, Springer never never did realize what was going on. I guess I would be questioning, I mean, why aren't you holding him on? It's only a one-run ball game. I mean, you're telling the guy, go ahead and steal second base. So Krasinski said, well, if you're going to give it to me, I'm going to take it. Right. Although Springer could have just stepped off the slab if he'd known about it. He wasn't even looking at it. Well, they've seen something, like you say, maybe they've seen something in their scouting reports. So now runner in scoring position. Here's the 2-2 pitch. Swing at a foul back to the screen. What happens is a lot of times pitchers will check you once and then go. And that's probably what they've seen with, you know, some of the Astros pitchers. They check them and then they just take off. And that's what we saw from Dye. And even then, as you mentioned, Qualls just hit, held the ball. So, like a guy sets, yeah, looks one you, time, and, and then you go. know he's not going to look again. At least that's what they've seen in the scouting reports, apparently. And it's worked a little bit. It worked with Springer right here, that's for sure. 2-2 two -two pitch and a sharp curveball in the dirt for a ball. 3-2 and two the count. Iguchi on deck. Well, I think if you're the Astros, you try to make a perfect pitch here on Posednik, and if he doesn't bite... Then you go after Iguchi. And he has not swung the bat well in this postseason, except for the first series against the Boston Red Sox. Three and two, the count to Bassetti. That's a very big run out there at second base. Right now, it's a one-run game. Four to three, White Sox. Brzezinski with a long lead from second. Springer's 3-2 pitch. Curveball lined into right center field. That one is not going to be caught by anybody. It's heading to the wall. Coming in to score is Brzezinski. Pesednik around second, speeding toward third. Here comes the relay. No relay. A triple for Pesednik. Five to three White Sox. And when you talk about a big run, that is a big, big run in a ball game like this. And it gives Jinx a chance to go out there and just throw it and let it go and not worry about making any mistakes. Well, and it started with the Astros inviting Krasinski to steal a bag. And, you know, unlike the story with Chad Qualls was out there and Dye took off, they got the word to Qualls and he stepped off the slab and got him into a rundown. They didn't get him out, but he got him into a rundown. However, at no time did anybody alert Springer that, hey, Pres there, by the way, uh, there's Przinsky 40 feet off the back. <laughs> Maybe I ought to just go after him there. And a moment later, a triple by Pesetic, and a run is home. Now here is Iguchi, and he takes a called strike. Again, I'm surprised they threw the pitch that they threw to Pesetic because Iguchi has not swung the bat well. Make him be the one to drive in that big run out there, not Posetnik. He's 0 for 4, has not hit the ball out of the infield. And there's a ball way outside, backhanded by Osmus, a fastball missing. And it is one ball and one strike. Higuchi has grounded a third, grounded a second. He grounded into an inning-ending double play in the fourth. And he struck out to end the sixth. Those last two at-bats had runners in scoring position. 1-1 one, one pitch, way high for a ball. And the triple by Pesednik with Krasinski at second, only the second hit tonight by a White Sox batter with a runner in scoring position. 
They are now two for nine in that category. Houston, two for 11 in those clutch at bats. Here's the two and one pitch. Fastball hit a high in the air to right. Over toward right center. Lane is under it. He's got it, and that ends the inning. But a very, very big run for the White Sox. Now to the ninth inning. Lane, Osmus, and Everett do up. They got pinch hitters on the bench available. We may see one or two of them. And it is 5-3 Chicago. The World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service, continues after these messages from your local station. Daytona Dogs, serving Chicago-style hot dogs and more. Try these taste-tempting Vienna hot dogs, jumbo dogs, Italian beef or sausage, Polish sausage, and steak burgers are some of the many dogs Daytona Dogs serves. Next time you're in the mood for the taste that made Chicago famous, stop on in to Daytona Dogs. Proud supporters of the Chicago White Sox. Go Sox! Located on West International Speedway Boulevard, Daytona Beach, half mile past the racetrack. Call today for takeout at 258-9200. 258-9200. Are you hot under the collar? Well, keep your cool with Tropical Auto Air with two convenient locations to serve you better. 1092 South Ridgewood Avenue, Edgewater, and 700 South Nova Road, Daytona. Tropical Auto Air offers a free 20-point service check, including belts, hoses, fluids, and more. We also offer a free air conditioning and heating check and a free brake inspection. Radiator flush on most cars starting at just $34.95. Tune-ups and radiator flush just $54.95 for most cars. CV axles at just $89. 95 for most cars. Timing belt specials only 99.95 for most cars. And if your engine light is on and you have engine trouble, Tropical Auto Air offers a free diagnostic check. We have complete auto repair with fully ASC certified factory trained mechanics on both foreign and domestic. Also factory trained import specialists for Toyota, Honda, and Nissan. For all your auto repair needs, it's Tropical Auto Air. 1092 South Ridgewood Avenue, Edgewater, 428-3787 and 700 South Nova Road, Daytona, 226 2070. Southside Collision, located at 206 North Young Street, US 1 Ormond Beach, is your one stop for expert auto body repair and color matching. At Southside Collision, we have personal service with pride and quality in our work. And remember, we beat higher dealer costs with quick turnarounds to get you back on the road faster. Ask about our senior discounts. That's Southside Collision, 206 North Young Street, US 1, Ormond Beach. Call 615-6266. If you like... Jason Lane will lead off. A, uh, another guy with power and uh, much healthier and younger than Jeff Bagwell. So we'll see what he can do with the 100-mile-an-hour the heat of Bobby Jenks. Here's the pitch. Fastball right down the middle. Strike one, Joe. He took something off that one just to lay it in there. Only 97 miles an hour. Well, I think the Astros are going to go up there and make him throw strikes. You know, the first guy wasn't going to swing at the first pitch. And that's smart baseball. Jenks throws. Fastball. Swung on a fly ball along the right field line. Coming in and to his left is Die into foul ground into a slide. And he did not catch the ball. Got the glove out there. Almost and not quite. Well, you know, I've never been a fan of that sliding unless you're trying to protect yourself from the stands. He gets there, he goes in his glove, and then it comes out. When he hits the ground, his, his glove hits the ground as he's trying to bring it away, and it, the ground causes the fumble. So the ground can cause a fumble? Yeah, in, in baseball. All right. <laughs> No whistles in baseball, no. though. <laughs> On to the count to Jason Lane. He is 0 for 3 in the game. The pitch. And a curveball struck him out. That's not fair. That really isn't fair, John. When you can throw 99 miles an hour and you have a good curveball. This is not a rolling curveball. This is a good one. I mean, he's got a sharp curveball after being able to throw hard with the fastball. And then you come with a good breaking ball. The right-handed hitters really do not have a chance. And Osmus is going to hit for himself here. Adam Everett is out on deck. And the pitch. Fastball. Strike. And it's on one. Again, 97 miles an hour. We're reading right off the stadium radar gun. 
Osmus has singled to right, flied out to shallow right center, and been hit by a pitch. Here's the pitch. Fastball bounced past the mound to short. In the field it is Uribe, and he throws him out at first. Two down in the ninth inning. The well, White Sox lead five to three. That's some kind of consolation anyway, John. They had had four consecutive strikeouts. The Astros had that since yeah. the single by Berkman in the eighth inning. If either Ensberg or Lamb could have done what Osmus just yeah. did, they would have tied the game in the eighth inning. Just put the ball in play. Two down. Adam Everett. Right-handed hitter takes a strike. A fastball at 97 in there. Everett is 0 for 3. Is hit into a force out. Grounded to third and hit into another force out his last time. Two down. Nobody on. Jenks to the plate. Swing and a miss. A fastball. It was down below the knees. And he chased it. I mean, you have to decide in a hurry when a pitch yeah. is coming in that fast. <laughs> Everybody's standing here. On the south side of Chicago, 5-3 to three White Sox, two down. The 0-2 pitch, struck it out! A high fastball at 98 miles an hour, and the White Sox have won game one of the World Series. And Bobby Jenks came on with runners at first and third and a one-run lead of the eighth inning. He struck out the veteran Jeff Bagwell to win that threat and retires the side in order in the ninth inning. Two more on strikeouts. And the question was, after all of the inactivity, when Ozzie Guillen finally went to his bullpen, how would they respond? Well, we have the answer. They responded beautifully, almost better than you could have expected, even if they had been working on a regular basis lately. Well, no doubt about it, the White Sox bullpen did a great job, but I have to give the Astros a little ding a little bit because in the sixth and eighth inning, all they had to do was put the ball in play, you know, up the middle or someplace, and they would have scored a run. They were not able to do that, and then Jinx and just took over in the bottom of the eighth with two outs, and after that, it was over. The one thing I see here is that, you know, whoever has the lead going into the ninth inning with Lidge and maybe... Uh, Jinx, you're not going to score. Well, Bobby Jinx, we got to look at him tonight. Most impressive. He is standing by in the field, and here is Dan Schulman to chat with him. Bobby, you hadn't pitched in a couple of weeks. What was the adrenaline like out there? Oh, yeah. No, stay sharp in the bullpens. A ninth inning to get that extra run in the top of the ninth. How much easier did that make it for you? Well, it took a little bit of extra pressure off uh, knowing I just had to get out there and get the first guy. It was the most important thing. You started the year in the minors. Now you're closing in the World Series. 41,000 people are going nuts. Is this a dream come true? Oh, yeah. It's everybody's dream come true, especially for me. Uh, you know, I've been a fan all my life, and this is all I've ever wanted to do is pitch in the first game of the World Series. It's just something real special for me. You threw 100 on one pitch. Did it feel like 1,000 tonight? No, no. I was just trying to keep it nice and easy so I didn't have to try to do too much. Congratulations. Good Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, back to you. Thanks, Dan, and congratulations to Bobby Jenks. And uh, and that was a great test under fire for him, even though it's not the same Bagwell we're used to seeing. I mean, he found a way to get those base hits, even if they were often just blue pits as a pinch hitter in September and into October, Joe. I mean, he was a tough out in those very situations. Well, I know, like you mentioned, it was Jeff Bagwell who hasn't played all year, but guess what? I don't care who you would have put in that situation. The way he was throwing the ball, I don't know if they could have even put the ball in play. So uh, he, it was more about jinx than it was about Bagwell being, you know, not ready. But again, I mean, the White Sox bullpen was great, even after all the layoff. And even though Contreras wasn't solid, they shut the Astros out for the last six innings, and that's what's important. Well, it, it, it kind of reminded you of Gagne. He throws hard the way Gagne did at his best. Has that big curveball, although Gagne also has that changeup, that forkball changeup that he throws, uh, which we did not see from Jenks, but uh, very, very impressive. And it's right when you least expected it. I guess it was Jason Lane up there. We're seeing all this heat. And then Jenks drops down this devastating curveball on him. Well, the two-run two, two, uh, the two run lead allowed him to go to his second pitch. If it was just a one-run lead, we were going to see nothing but hard, hard stuff. And he went to the curveball. And I tell you what, I know how good Gagne was, but I don't think his fastball was ever this, this good. 
Now, the other guy who did a great job tonight, and there were several White Sox that you have to give kudos to, but Joe Creedy hit the home run that proved to be the winning run of the game. He broke a 3-3 tie. It was all the way back in the fourth inning when he hit it. That's another big home run for Creedy, another big hit for Creedy. And he's had several of them, not only in this postseason, but even right at the end of the season when they were facing Cleveland. And even before that, when they faced Detroit and clinched the division title. And he also played third race like Brooks Robinson. <laughs> I mean, he made a play with a runner at third and one out in the sixth inning, diving to steal a ball hit by Morgan Ensberg very sharply. He got the out, and Tavares had to hold. And then in the seventh inning, with the runners at first and third and two down, Biggio up, and he made a headlong dive to rob him of a hit and save a run again. So those were defensive plays in the in the clutch in the late innings to protect that lead that he had given his team with his home run. Well, they both saved runs, and they only won by one, so he saved two runs. Well, we're talking about Joe Creedy and his big night. He's standing by with Dan Showman on the field. Dan? Joe, great game. Even though Roger Clemens wasn't at his best, what did it mean when he got out of there and you guys got into their pen early? Oh, I mean, uh, you know, Roger's a great pitcher, and we knew he was going to come with his A game tonight. And, uh, you know, to see him go out, I mean, uh, I think it was kind of a relief for some of the players. But, uh, you know, he had some good stuff, you know, tonight. But, uh, you know, unfortunately, he wasn't able, you know, for us to be able to go out there, you know, more than, you know, two or three innings. You hit a home run off Wandy Rodriguez, but you also made two huge defensive plays. How big were those? Oh, I mean, uh, you know, they had a chance to score with, uh, you know, runners in scoring position, and uh, I'm just glad I was able to get some leather on the ball. Ozzie Guillen always said, Joe Creedy's my guy at third base. What did that mean to you over the last couple of years? Oh, it's huge. I mean, whenever you got a manager who backs you and uh, does nothing but build your confidence and uh, know you're going to be out there every day and a chance to play in the big leagues, you can't ask for more than that. How about Bobby Jenks coming in throwing 99? Oh, he's been awesome for us, you know, you know, half the season or, you know, however long he's been up. I mean, for him to come up and do that, I mean, he started the year in double A and be able to come in the big leagues and dominate like he has has been, you know, huge for us. Thanks. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. Joe Creedy, big star tonight. Back to you. Thanks, Dan. And congratulations to Joe Creedy, the pride of Westphalia, Illinois. He grew up a Cardinals fan, not a, not a White Sox fan, but a Cardinals fan. John, I would wonder how the minor league players were hitting Bobby Jinks. I mean, the big league guys can't hit him. How would he look like in the minor leagues? I don't think that many guys were hitting him in the minor leagues no. either. <laughs> Although he was walking a lot of guys yeah. down there. All right. The White Sox have won game one of the World Series, 5-3 to three over the Astros. Tonight's game has been brought to you by Chase. Now, you can earn double rewards on everyday purchases. Love the double from Chase. By the Xerox Work Center C2424 Multifunction System. By Equifax. Get your credit score and credit report now. Visit Equifax.com or call 800-4-Equifax. And by J.C. Penney. Great selection of big and tall clothes for men. It's all inside J.C. Penney. I'm John Miller with Joe Morgan. We'll come back and take a look at what's next. Dan Schulman and Dave Campbell are also standing by with the Ameriprise post-game show. That's all still to come. Once again, from the south side of Chicago, the White Sox have taken the first game of the World Series 5-3 to three over the Astros. And this has been the World Series on ESPN Radio, delivered by the United States Postal Service.